Now on BBC Two, live and uninterrupted coverage of the Chancellor's budget speech to the House of Commons, introduced by David Dimbleby. Budget day and a chance for the Tories to revive their flagging fortunes. Good afternoon and welcome to the 1995 budget programme. This is the budget which could make or break the Conservative Party and its Chancellor Kenneth Clark. It's his third budget and it comes as the Tories are around 30 points behind in the polls. And so of course he's under pressure from his own party workers who know what they want. I think it's extremely important that we put as a top priority at the cutting income tax rates. And we have to reassure the public that we're getting back to our traditional tax-cutting agenda and letting people uh, spend their own money in the way that they choose to do. We're going to be hearing more from the Tories of Edgbaston later on when they've heard the budget. But there are others he must try to satisfy too. The financial markets, which will need reassurance that nothing he does this afternoon risks higher inflation or jeopardises the lowering of interest rates. And Britain's manufacturers, like the van makers LDV, formerly Leyland Dat Trucks in Birmingham, watching anxiously as the recovery seems to slow down and exports slowing down too. They'll want help to be concentrated on business. And still others will be watching, like this study group at the London School of Economics, who have their eagle eye on the poorer sections of society where government tax and spending changes can have a particularly harsh effect. It's reckoned that when he's done his sums at number 11, the Chancellor will have somewhere between three and five, possibly six billion pounds to give away the equivalent of two or three pence taken off income tax. And that giveaway being the gap between what he expects to receive in tax and duties and all the rest of it, and what he decides to borrow, set against what he plans to spend. We'll be hearing details of all three today. And if he does end up with that three to five billion or so to give away, he's got a number of options. It's not just a matter of cutting income tax. And we'll have a look now before we go into detail about what he might do and discuss the state of the economy and all the rest of it, at the options that he actually has with Peter Snow. Peter. No doubt then uh, what the Chancellor is up to. He wants to stash up the biggest pile of money he can on one side of his desk so that he can finance tax cuts on the other side. Now the chances are the sort of judgment the Chancellor has made is that he can afford net, in net terms, a relaxation of the economy, net tax cuts of some three billion pounds. But of course within that, as long as he piles up enough on the credit side, he can give away five, six, seven billion, who knows, depending on the amount of indir extra indirect taxation or the amount of public spending he can cut. So I'm going to take you now on a flying visit to the BBC's Budget Town, which we built specially to show you how people in town, in the high street and the houses roundabout, are going to be affected by this budget. Now, this is purely an illustration of what the Chancellor might do. First of all, indirect taxation, as much as he can to finance those tax cuts. Starting with every Chancellor's favourite protocol, the local off-licence. Right, so, drinks first of all. Perhaps beer may go up by two pence a pint. One penny would be enough for inflation, two pence would be a bit of extra money for him. Five pence a bottle on wine, perhaps? Spirits, who knows, sometimes no extra duty on spirits. He may want a bit of extra money, 30 pence a bottle, perhaps, on a bottle of whiskey or brandy. Cigarettes, 15 pence a packet would be pretty tough on smokers, but that's what he needs this time, more money. Down the road to the garage. Now, 5% is the obligatory statutory increase in the amount of duty on petrol each year now. Four pence a litre would be just a little bit more than that 5%. That would pile up a bit of extra money in indirect taxation as well. The disc you have in your car windscreen, the vehicle excise duty, that could have got five pounds for inflation to 140 pounds. Then on down uh, past the pub, it's going to be a bit expensive going to the pub after this budget, I would think. The news agent, now he might here have a bit of a surprise for us. He might, for example, if he really does want to pile up that pile on the left hand side of his desk, uh, put newspapers and books under the VAT heading so that you charge perhaps 5% on newspapers and books that are given another billion pounds or so. The uh, shop front next to the newsagent reminds us that this is now a unified budget. It's tied up not just with adjusting taxation, but with looking at spending too. And he may announce in this budget, he'll certainly announce what he's doing with spending, he may announce that he and Peter Lilly between them have managed to agree that the Social Security budget, that biggest of all the budgets, uh, is going to save 0.6 billion pounds or so. 
all contributing to financing tax cuts. Another target for the Chancellor, perhaps, transport. He may have a go at the roads, 0.4 billion perhaps off-road construction, capital expenditure on roads uh, in the coming year. We're always talking about next year, next financial year from next April to April 97. Now there's a lot of pressure on him from the Tory backbench to do something about the housing market. People don't think he's going to do a great deal about mortgage interest tax relief, but he may, for example, as a gesture, abolish perhaps stamp duty, the stamp duty you pay, the 1% you pay on houses over £60,000 in value. Now all that, of course, is the background to the real punchline in this budget, what he's going to do about income tax. There's our family, there's their house, what could he do? Well, first of all, he could go for the allowances. He could put them up just by inflation, 3% odd. That would see most people who are paying tax one pound a week better off. He could widen the 20% band on that bottom slice of income to perhaps by another two and a half thousand pounds. That would be another two pounds a week that people would be better off. He could do either or both of those or none of those and just concentrate on the big headline of the basic rate of tax. Basic rate is now 25 pence in the pound. Maybe he'll cut it by a whole 2p. That would cost him four billion pounds in a full year. That would be expensive, but that would create the headlines. And he might even go further than that. He might say, not only am I cutting it this year, I'm going to cut it next year, or plan to cut it next year as well, by a further perhaps one pence, bringing it down to 22 pence in the pound by April 1997. So there's a sort of broad background. He could put all those together or do them separately or whatever. But of course, the background, all the time he's got to think about what Labour are promising. Labour are promising to try and get the starting rate of tax down to 10%. So he wants to try and trump Labour somehow as well. David. Peter, thank you very much. Well, obviously, the Chancellor is faced with pressures on all sides. We said at the beginning from people who want one or other of those measures and people who think that none are appropriate unless he makes big cuts in public spending. I'm surrounded here in the studio by seven wise men and women, I'm glad to say, and uh, we're going to be taking their advice both about what they think the Chancellor should be doing and when he's sat down, whether he's done the kind of thing that they like or whether he's taken risks they don't think he should. Uh, Patricia Vaz is a director of British Telecom and she was Businesswoman of the Year. Now Patricia, what do you want to hear from the Chancellor today? What do you think it's safe and prudent for him to do? I think what we're expecting and what we're hoping for is a budget that encourages growth in the economy which we've seen reducing and sliding away over the last year. And to do that I think we've got to get some confidence back into both businesses in terms of confident to invest in the future and then some confidence in the consumer market so that we can create a bit of demand. And is that income tax cuts or is that other sorts of measures? I think there's a balance of way, methods that a Chancellor could use. What we do not want to see is anything that smacks of short-termism. So if he gives away too much and we know that's going to need to be corrected by interest rate, ra rate rises in the future, then that's really bad news. So I would say that an interest rate cut is more likely to stimulate the economy than almost any giveaway he can manufacture. Now, Ruth Lee is the director of the policy unit at the Institute of Directors. Now, the Chancellor obviously, obviously wants to win the next election. Uh, you probably think that he shouldn't do anything too lavish. Well, absolutely. I think uh, what we would say is that we'd like to see a bit of fiscal rectitude in this budget, apart from anything else. In fact, uh, we've just heard that Peter was talking about a net tax cut of three billion. We wouldn't actually go for that. We think public borrowing is pretty dire as it is. You're probably talking about 30 billion on the public sector borrowing account for this year. I mean, that's bad news for the financial markets in any case. We'd actually say if there are any tax cuts, then they should be funded out of public expenditure cuts. Moreover, I almost expect that to happen today, but we'll see on that point. But isn't the danger of that that you go down singing your anthem with the ship? Well, I think that the important thing is, too, that there is an opportunity to get public expenditure cuts quite easily. Uh, there's a £6 billion stuck in the continuous reserve for next financial year. That can easily be raided. No hassle at all. And I think he'll do that. And then he'll have some tax well, you cuts don't, out you of don't think a Chancellor needs a bit set back for a rainy day? Well, uh, there is £6 billion is a lot. And unless you have a really major expenditure, then it should be all right. And I would certainly agree with Patricia. Let's have some interest rate cuts. Absolutely. I think that's probably one of the best ways to get the economy going again. John Monks is the General Secretary of the TUC. Uh, John Monks, what would you want? Something slightly different, I suspect. Well, I think if the Chancellor thinks that tax cuts will be the election winner, I think he's wrong because there's a deep sense of insecurity around Britain today in many parts of the community. And there's a lot of uncertainty about the employment future. We've seen two recent sets of rises in unemployment from the unemployment figures. And I think the priority for the uh, Chancellor is actually to kick-start the recovery, to ensure that it continues, and he can best do that 
by promoting public investment, by targeting help at the long term unemployed, and if he's going to make any changes in the tax regime, then I think going for fairness and not feeding the fat cats who've done so well in Britain over recent years. But would you include fat cats as uh, basic taxpayers at 25 pence? Well, I'd certainly like to see if there are tax cuts, and they're certainly not our priority. I'd like to right. see those that actually concentrated on the low paid in terms of changing uh, the, 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 the point at which right. people pay tax. Well, Peter Jay is, of course, our economics editor at the BBC. Peter, just turn to the problem the Chancellor has. Where we, what would you identify as the difficulty he has and, and how he might get out of it? The difficulty is the lamentable state of the economy. The ship to which you referred is seriously waterlogged. Economic recovery has come to a halt. The gap between the actual and healthy non-inflationary level of output is now getting wider again, having only been reduced by half from the high point of the recession. The economy is in desperate need of a boost. Now, that can theoretically be given through the budget. It can be given by cutting interest rates or by a combination of the two. It's very important in discussing figures that we all be exceedingly clear. The three billion that Peter Snow is quite rightly talking about is the three billion which is theoretically available from spending cuts which have already been made by the cabinet though not yet officially announced that does nothing to boost the economy that just keeps the fiscal balance the same as it was before less spending less tax any boost that he needs to give to the economy and in my personal opinion it needs to be very large indeed if he's to avoid uh, drifting back into a second recession has to come over and above that so the problem is not as people have been stating that on the one hand politically he's tempted to do this but on the other hand economically he ought only to do that both politics and economics points in my judgment to a substantial expansion he won't do it because he's trapped by what he said over the last two years about how he's got to balance the budget before the end of uh, this decade a proposition for which there's very little economic rationale but he's invested a lot of political and personal capital in that proposition. But what kind of boost would you like to see? Or rather, do you think it might be appropriate for the economy as it is? Well, I think the urgency is to get the economy moving again quickly. How do the you do phrase, that? Well, let me answer your question. The phrase stop go, you will recall, was invented in the Plowden Report 34 years ago uh, to describe the act of cutting public investment uh, for short-term economic reasons. Uh, if there are big cuts in public investment in order to achieve this three billion saving, which is what we've been led to expect, that is going to have an immediate and big effect on the economy. To counteract that, I very much doubt whether the kind of interest rate cuts which he might be able to persuade Eddie George, the Governor of the Bank of England, to accept are going to be anything like enough. You therefore need tax cuts which have a big and fairly immediate impact effect on people's spending. You haven't given a figure. I asked you whether you had a figure in mind. Well, I think that he needs to give the economy a boost of something like 1%, 1% to 1.5% of GDP, and that amounts to a figure of between 6 and £9 billion. Pounds. Right, thanks very much. Uh, Andrew Britton, do you agree with that? I agree that the economy is slowing down and that a stimulus is needed. I don't think I would uh, feel it was safe in current circumstances to give as big a boost as Peter Jay has suggested because I think that would backfire in terms of the effect that it would have on financial markets. What I would like to see is the uh, increase in uh, demand in the economy targeted particularly on the areas of the economy in which demand is weak. So it's not a, an overall tax cut that helps everyone, but something rather carefully targeted to help the people who need it most. Last year's budget was a budget for the unemployed. I think we should have another budget for the unemployed this year. Not enough was done in the last budget to get uh, jobs created, and since that budget, the fall in unemployment seems to have come to a stop. So that's where my priority would lie. Um, you, you were one of the wise men who advises, you are one of the wise men who advises the, the, the Chancellor. Do you agree and do you say to him what Peter Jay said a moment ago, which is that the economy is running seriously below its potential and therefore we're in danger of it going back into recession? I don't think that the view of the wise men as a whole is uh, as extreme as that. I think that the view is that the economy is slowing down and that some imp extra impetus should be given to it, but that the, the amount of headroom, the amount of extra growth that can take place without stimulating investment is fairly limited. So I would put my figure would be around five billion, which is a bit bigger than you've indicated in the opening shots, but considerably smaller than Peter Jay's figure. Right. Well, um, Peter Spencer is a professor at Birkbeck College and an advisor to the bankers Klein Watt Benson. Um, Peter Spencer, how does he combine the politics with the economics? We've heard about the economics. How does he make that politically palatable, in your opinion? I think we have to go back to Black Wednesday to answer that question, the day we left the ERM, and recognize that the lower interest rates and the pound that we saw then did bring 
a very real economic recovery, but that was simply not recognized within the country because of these feelings of job insecurity that we've been talking about, because of the tax increases and everything else. What he has to do today is translate that economic recovery into political recovery for the Tories. He's got to keep the recovery going and translate it into uh, votes. And any ideas how that might be done? He's got to cut headline rates of tax. He's got to maintain consistency in his policies. And he's got as well to cut the PSBR so those interest rates can come okay. down. Peter, can we have a look at the political problem that he faces and, and why it's still going wrong for the Tories? Well, first of all, the government's political popularity. <clears throat> and uh, no government in recorded history uh, has been so far behind the opposition for so long as this one. Now, there is two years ago, there's the line of the unadjusted poll figures, the raw figures from the pollsters, 48% uh, Labour a couple of years ago, 26% the Tories, Liberal Democrats way down here at the bottom, a whole 22% gap, and so it went on through 95, so it's gone on uh, through 94 and 95, opening up to a 30% gap in the unadjusted figures in the polls uh, in the last couple of years. Nothing like it's been seen in the history of polling, even if you believe the pollsters are way out. Still, there is a horrific gap, and no sign of a closing uh, of the gap at all. Even when you look at the adjusted figures, and all the polling organizations now have their ways of adjusting the figures to allow for any bias there may be and people being rather shy about admitting they're going to vote Tory. Even so, still when you adjust, there's still more than a 20% gap between the two main parties. Now what is so interesting and unique about the present situation is that whatever the economy has done over the last three years since the general election, it hasn't been helping the Conservatives. The economy has been perking up now and again, but it hasn't pulled the government up with it. Just look at consumer confidence as registered by Murray at the last general election. Now this is a rather complicated exercise, but this is optimists versus pessimists. When you subtract pessimists about the economy from the optimists about the economy, looking forward next year, at the time of the election in April 1992, 21% majority for the optimists. And that did result in a conservative uh, win at the last general election. What happened since then to consumer confidence was it dropped massively down at the time of the uh, September 92 devaluation of the pound, the pound leaving the ERM, credibility of the government suffered enormously, and the worry about the economy was very considerable. But that very quickly recovered consumer confidence, not the government's popularity, consumer confidence, when it looked as if the withdrawal from the ERM had done the economy a bit of good. What happened to the government's popularity? The lead the Conservatives had over Labour was 8% of the general election. By the time that consumer confidence had recovered, at the end of 92, beginning of 93, the government's popularity, as represented by the lead over Labour, minus 14%, the Tories 14% behind Labour, hadn't recovered at all. It was down here. And over the next couple of years, consumer confidence bubbling along there. This is Morrie's uh, level of consumer confidence, the optimist minus the pessimist. Bobbing along here, occasionally showing a plus figure, down here now at minus 16%. But the government's popularity, the lead of the Conservatives over Labour, the actual lag behind Labour, looked like a negative lead, down here now at minus 29%. So there is the picture then. The government's popularity apparently suffering a huge, as Peter Spencer was saying, a huge thump uh, of credibility here in the middle of 92, end of 92, not recovering at all, all the way down there, in spite of consumer confidence bobbing along at the top of the screen. And when you look at another, perhaps this is borne out more uh, graphically by another measure of the uh, impression people have about the two parties. Here is the Conservatives. When, when asked the question, who handles the economy best, more people at the time of the last election thought the Tories were more efficient at handling the economy than Labour. But look what's happened since then. In spite of economic recovery, no matter what's happened to the economy, interest rates or anything else, the Labour Party has been building up its lead over the Conservatives on their impression of being competent at handling the economy. David. Well, that's the, the chill wind that's blowing through the Tory ranks. And Steve Richards, our political correspondent, has been in Birmingham to two constituencies that could, as a result of that feeling, be very vulnerable or could be quite vulnerable or potentially vulnerable to Labour at the next election. So he went to Birmingham. He began by going to the theatre. Since 1987, your shirts have always been kept on the third shelf down. They haven't been kept on the second shelf down since we moved from Woking. Woking? We weren't so well off in Woking, if you remember, darling. 
You have a smaller wardrobe. Middle class angst in Middle England. This local production of an Alan Akebourne play may not be for real, but the fictional social and financial obsessions mirror the worries of real voters. For the middle classes in what should be a safe conservative seat here, taxes have gone up, house prices have gone down, and they've turned against the government. It's not surprising that just down the road from the theatre company here at their local party headquarters, conservatives are placing their hopes in the budget. It's been a difficult few years for them, but now they expect Kenneth Clark to give them good news and for them to reap the political dividends. The local MP is certainly looking for income tax cuts to help keep the map blue, but what she wants most is a boost for manufacturing industry. Of course, cuts in uh, income tax are important in that people need to have, feel they have more money in their pockets to spend. But then again, um, if you don't get the base right of these great industries, then uh, sooner or later, whether people have got more money in their pockets or not, there's a difficulty. But under the approving gaze of a three times election winner, activists are looking to tax cuts for their political salvation. Well, I, I think the most important thing you must do is to reduce income tax by one or two pence in the pound. I think our supporters expect that, and we have to reassure the public that we're getting back to our traditional tax-cutting agenda and letting people uh, spend their own money in the way that they choose to do. So I hope he reduces income tax by that amount. Mm, that's, that, that's true, but the, the thing at the same time is the budget has to be credible to financial markets. The, the sums have to add up. <laughs> A city created by its markets and by the inventiveness, determination and vision of its people. The best of Birmingham highlighted in a multimedia show. Can you strengthen the music so we get a tub thump, yeah, yeah. A tub thump of a real feel of, uh, of industry working? But the producer is all too aware that the voters' mood doesn't coincide with the upbeat images. He was leader of the Tory group until he unexpectedly lost his seat in May. Now, he says, it's time for the budget goodies to be handed out. It is uniquely important because it is the one last attempt they've got in financial terms to encourage people to understand what conservatism is all about. And trying to do that, possibly within two or three months of a general election, will be seen as a buy-off. It has to be done now so people can see what, what the pain that they've, had to, that they've been called upon to, uh, to uh, have during the last two or three years has paid off and that the government's investment in the future of this country is sound and that, after all, it's the people who have the dividends. But the fluctuating fortunes of manufacturing in the West Midlands mean that when Tories seek tax changes, they're not just talking about income tax cuts. Concessions for firms like the van makers LDV, recovering from recession and now investing £8 million in a new robot line to improve production, are seen as a priority. And if more companies are to invest in new plant, they argue that lower interest rates are at least as important as cuts in the basic rate. Well, the majority of our business is supplied to the automotive industry. And at the moment, we're seeing a, a marked downturn in demand. So I think that uh, he has to boost demand immediately, otherwise we could face a new recession. So I'm looking to see disposable income increased, and that can be through a combination of tax cuts and interest rate cuts. And I feel he has to do both. Why do you think demand is going down? What is it that is stopping people putting money in their pockets at the moment, then, do you think? I think it's a lack of confidence, a lack of the so-called feel-good factor. Uh, people are reluctant to make any long-term commitments. They're just looking for today. They won't even look to tomorrow. And something has to be, to be done to induce them to, to go out and spend on cars and other domestic items. Birmingham is not untypical with its mix of industry, shops and nearby suburbs where the Conservatives have prospered until recently. But although tax cuts would be popular, there's also a demand for spending on decent services, from hospitals and schools to Birmingham University where there's a warning of the dangers Kenneth Clark faces if he makes a quick dash for electoral popularity. I think this is the real danger that political expediency is going to win over economic sense, that there will be too big a tax cut, that it will be impossible to rein in government expenditure, the government will end up borrowing more, and that's going to really create problems for the economy.
foreign exchange markets, financial markets going to react badly to that. Income tax cuts may grab the headlines, but not necessarily the votes in areas such as this. It's the return of the elusive feel-good factor which would encourage some Conservatives to return to the fold. Only then could John Major, with any confidence, let the real theatre of an election campaign begin and anticipate the curtain finally closing on the economic anxieties of Middle England, if not all the social ones. We could even meet somewhere and uh, have a session. Meet somewhere? <laughs> yes, I'd like that. Goodbye. Goodbye. Who is that? Who is that? No one you know. Just the boy I was at school with, dear. Steve Richards reporting. Well, now we go up to Birmingham again, and we join there three leading Birmingham politicians who are in the LDV factory, which is why they are unaccustomed to see them sitting there. But anyway, there they are. Uh, first of all, Bernard Zisman, who's a former Tory leader who was defeated in the local elections at Birmingham City Council. Mr Zisman, what do you want to see out of today's budget? What do you think would work for the Tories? Well, I think that the Chancellor has to address what is, after all, the grassroots support, not only of the Conservative Party, but the the great wealth creators of this country, and that is the people who have been encouraged to own their own homes and find themselves, in some cases, in some difficulty. He has to give some help with those people who have mortgages, mortgage relief. He has to restore confidence in that the house prices can, can begin again to rise with some, with some control, so people have a feel-good factor. That, to my way of thinking, is the most important thing he has to do. And you put that ahead of income tax cuts? I think income tax cuts need well, we're talking about cuts in taxation, and that needs to be more selective. I, I, he may well go for across the board, but I'd much prefer to see something which was, which was targeted at those parts of the population who need it most and those who could do the most with it. Not just the headlines, in other words. Not just the headline grabbing. Theresa Stewart, uh, the leader of Birmingham City Council, the new leader, what do you think ought to be there, then, uh, for the Tories? I mean, you, you obviously very critical about the way things are going. What would you like to see happen? More investment in schools, in social services, in the vital services run by local authorities all over the country. That will create jobs and will provide the extra investment in our future. Do you see this as a, a political battle between the two parties, where victory is going to be decided by the political reaction rather than what happens to the economy? I mean, I, 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 do you think the Tories are after good headlines today? Certainly. It's probably their last budget, Kenneth Clark's last budget. It's his final chance to try and win victory for the Conservatives. John Hemming of the Liberal Democrats, you're a, a businessman as well. What do you want from this budget? Well, I think from a business or a political angle, you need to see stability. You need to have security such that basically interest rates are not pushed up by excessive deficits, and we need to see investment in education so people can be trained to adequate levels. Places like LDV have managed to put on 100, 400 jobs. They need stability to grow. They don't need boom and bust. What they don't need is what happened four years ago, is where the government borrowed money for tax cuts and then had to put up the taxes again later to pay for the tax cut they'd borrowed for. Well, thank you all very much. In a moment from Birmingham politics, we'll be going down to Westminster politics, where uh, Stephen Dorrell, John Prescott and Richard Home are waiting to talk to us. Just before we go over to them, though, there's been a lot of talk about income tax and how it might be changed to boost the Tory fortunes, but it can be changed in various ways, and Peter's just got a description of the options the Chancellor has. It hits various income levels in, of course, very, very different ways, David. Supposing we reckon he's got £5 billion to spend on tax cuts, to finance his tax cuts. Let's just take three ranges of income. £5,000 a year uh, person down here, something like a fifth of uh, taxpayers are on something like that. £19,000 a year is average earnings. The average taxpayer is a bit lower than that, but that's average earnings, 19000 a year. There's someone quite well off on £40,000 a year. Now take the first option and assume he's spending all his £5 billion on a basic rate cut. Two and a half pence in the pound, two and a half p down on the basic rate of 25 pence. No good, of course, to the person on 5,000 a year who doesn't pay the basic rate. Uh, he or she is on the 20% band. The £19,000 a year person will be nearly £6 better off each week. The £40,000 a year person with a 2.5% cut in the basic rate is £10 a week, 
520-odd pounds a year, better off if he cuts the basic rate by 2.5 pence, if he puts all his money into the basic rate. Take another example. He could make the 20% lower rate band effectively the basic rate by widening it by some 6,000 pounds. He could make the lower rate 20% band the, the rate which most taxpayers pay. Supposing he went for that. Then, again, no good to the person only paying 20 pence already, but the £5.77 would be the tax cut for someone on 19,000 a year, the same amount for the person on 40,000 pounds a year. Perhaps quite an attractive political option, achieving the Tories' objective in one go, the 20% basic rate. Another way of doing it uh, is to raise the thresholds, the allowances, by a full 800 pounds, the full 5 billion going on that. Three pounds and eightpence this time for the person down here on 5,000 a year, only £3.85 for the average earnings person, and £6.15, because of course they get the full allowance against their 40% tax, for the person on £40,000 a year. So that would be better for the person down here who's worse off. Now, what about Labour's idea of introducing a 10% starting rate? Spend the whole £5 billion on that, and see how wide you can extend a 10% rate before you have to go up to 20%. That would mean, for the £5,000 a year person, something like the same amount as the thresholds would give them, £2.85 a week tax cut, £4 a week tax cut for the personal average earnings, £4 a week for the £40,000 a year person there. So looking at all four of those options together, it very quickly becomes apparent that the biggest piles for the middle incomes and top incomes are the ones you get from cutting the basic rate of tax, the 25 pence basic rate of tax. But if it's a question of doing the best you can for the lower paid, then you've got to choose between raising the thresholds and cutting the starting rate, the 20% rate at the moment, to perhaps 10%. David. Peter, thank you very much. Well, let's go down to Westminster and join the politician. Stephen Dorrell, the um, Health Secretary, is there for the Conservative Party. Mr Dorrell, from Peter Snow's pictures, it looks as though the 10% proposal that Labour put forward uh, shouldn't have been rubbished in quite the way the Tories rubbished it, but it does work quite well for people across the board. Well, there are a few points to make about that. The first is that it's all very fine talking about tax cuts uh, reducing rates, whether 10p for income tax or the uh, reduced rate of tax, the uh, enhanced capital allowances that Gordon Brown has promised, or more generously aid to treatment, all of that is moonshine unless you demonstrate how you're going to cut spending in order to be able to make room for those reduced tax rates. That's the first point to make. And the second point, actually even more important, is that when you look at a budget, you mustn't just look at the effect of the tax changes directly. What you must also do, because in the end it's more important, is look at the effect on the economy as a whole, because it's the performance of the economy as a whole that pays for people's improved living standards. That's why I very strongly agree with the Birmingham industrialist who said that what we need is a period of responsibility and stability. And I profoundly disagree with what Peter Jay said some time ago, calling for tax cuts, which if you add them all together, would have sounded like a total of 12 billion pounds. I think it's extraordinary that the BBC's economics correspondent should think that would be a responsible way of proceeding. Well, the BBC's economics editor, Peter, I just ought to let you to re reply to that, if you would, and then we'll go back down there. Well, it may sound extraordinary to the Secretary of State for Health, but it will not sound extraordinary to the Chancellor, because the Chancellor is familiar with what is happening to the output of the economy. The output of the economy is now running 3.5% below its healthy non-inflationary target level, and the gap is getting bigger. Uh, it's growing at an annual rate the last quarter of 1.5%. It needs to grow to 2.25% to stop the get gap getting bigger. It needs to grow faster than that in order to close the gap. It a stimulus of something like 1% to 1.5% of GDP with the absolute minimum required to achieve that effect without any risk of inflation. Stephen Dorrell? I'm not the only person to whom that sounded extraordinary. All the other commentators around your table were in varying degrees talking about the importance of stability and the importance of ensuring that tax cuts are paid for not by increased borrowing, which was what Peter was arguing for, uh, but by reduced spending. All right, John, John Prescott, could I come to you, the deputy leader of the Labour Party? Now, uh, the Labour Party hasn't spelt out what it wants. It talks about things in generalities at this stage. At the end of today, when we've had this budget, are you going to come out and say whether you support what the Chancellor has done or not, depending on what he says? Are you going to come clean well, I, with the electorate? I, I reject your argument that we talked in generalities. What we've said is we want to judge this budget against what it does for the economy and not the, to not the Tory party interest. All your experts have made clear that there's a fall in the demand of the economy. We have to deal with this deficiency and we also have to deal with the problems of investment. Now, if the government say to us that they're going to cut £3 billion in public expenditure, we have to judge what effect that is going to have on health, on education, on investment and the economy generally. And all the tax cuts are just one facet of it. I know everybody's 
putting their attention to that because largely it's near to the election. But I just ask them to remind themselves that the Tories have done this before. They promised the tax cuts, they go ahead with them, they get a boom in the kind of economy, and then they have to slash it back and put up other taxes. That's how we'll judge what we think is a proper support for this budget. And, and, and I, do you support what Peter Jay said about the need for a much bigger boost than other people have talked about to the economy? Well, I hear there's some differences about the size of the boost that Peter's talking about, but they don't disagree with fundamentally what he's saying. There is a deficiency here. We have to make up some of that difference, and you can either do it by tax cuts, or you can do it in the public expenditure side. These are the balances that have to be drawn in this particular budget. We've made it clear that we want to see it on the investment, on the economy, and getting people back to work. And that's why Gordon Brown tried to put together those ideas of the 10 and 15, as he has done, as a kind of taxation that is fairer, which is what we want in the tax system, is honest and sustainable, not just here for one year and go the next. And he's made a very important contribution to the argument of the role of tax and the development of the economy. Richard Holm, you're in charge of the Liberal Democrats' campaign when the general election comes, and the Liberal Democrats have been very critical of Labour on this and say that there should be higher taxes to pay for government spending. Isn't the true position that they're being cautious because they think they're close to power and you're not and therefore aren't? Well, I can't judge what Labour's motives are, but I think it's extremely uh, silly at this point in the economic cycle to pretend that the point of a budget is tax cuts and that the only issue is how it affects parties' electoral fortunes. That's a calculation we all make. But the important thing is what is going to help the economy. There I agree with John Prescott. I don't take the same view as him that it should be an auction between the Tory and Labour parties about who can give the biggest cuts, and that's what I'm afraid we're going to get in the next few days. What we would do is three things. First of all, take the lowest paid out of tax. That'll help employment. That'll get people who need it a real boost to get back into work. Secondly, we would invest, and we've said this before, and I think it's got a good response, invest in education, because although Peter Jay wants a short-term boost, what this country really needs is a long-term boost uh, of, of higher skills. Uh, and I think that uh, the third thing we need uh, is a cut within the foreseeable future in interest rates. I don't believe that will be done by continuing to pile up public borrowing at the rate the government is, which amounts to something like £1,000 every second. The public sector borrowing requirement is at this moment increasing. It's a time for us to be prudent instead of profligate on tax cuts. Stephen Dorrell, could I just come back to one point with you? Uh, it's been said by your own Chancellor that since the last election you've put up taxes, despite saying you wouldn't, by seven pence in the pound. And today the talk is of a possible two pence in the pound on income tax, something like that. Do you accept that voters will be judging your tax measures in the light of what's happened since the last election and uh, won't, won't be too uh, persuaded by a, a small increase today? I certainly think people will look at the uh, changes we introduced today and judge them by their total effect on people's living standards. That's actually something on which all three of us here have agreed. We have to look not just at the net change in 24 hours that the, uh, over which the Chancellor delivers his budget. We have to look at the effect of these changes on the economy and therefore on people's living standards. Not, I may suggest, uh, not just between uh, the last election and now, although that's a comparison I'm certainly uh, accept that we have to make, but a comparison between what happened uh, over the 16 years in office of this government. But I think also the, the key distinction that's been drawn as a result of this discussion that I've been listening to is between those who think that we should engage in substantial extra borrowing, of whom Peter Jay was the most prominent example, and those who say uh, that the scope for tax cuts, given the prevailing level of borrowing, which is actually falling, Richard, not rising, Given that, that we are still borrowing substantial amounts of money, uh, those who feel that we should be containing tax changes within the uh, scope delineated by spending cuts. John you Prescott wasn't great, clear about that. Yeah, but you should be given a greater in, uh, emphasis to investment. You're quite prepared to pump it into consumption. We have to talk about investment. We have to talk about jobs. We have to talk about training. We'll judge your budget on that and just how it makes our economy stronger, not the Tory party. I'm you promised tax cuts before was 7p in a pound higher than in 1979. You're just about coming into the electoral cycle, and it's nothing to do with the economy. It's all to do with party politics. I'm perfectly John happy Press to look at investment and at training, but the question that Labour... Gordon Brown, and you, you do. Gordon Brown and you have to answer is how much extra you think that we should be borrowing next year over and above what we're currently planning to borrow. Peter Jay thinks the figure is 9 billion extra borrowing. 
and you weren't clear whether you agreed with that or not. But Stephen, you yourself are planning, uh, and I have to argue with this point with you, you yourselves have projected that next year you will increase borrowing further, and it is that that I think makes so many people very suspicious indeed of this idea that somehow there is money there uh, for tax cuts. Richard, uh, Richard Holm, uh, John Prescott and Stephen Doll, thank you all very much indeed for joining us from Westminster. Sorry to break off there, but let's go down now to the London School of Economics. I said there were people keeping an eagle eye on changes in the budget. And down there is uh, Holly Sutherland and uh, Kerry Oppenheim. Uh, Holly Sutherland, what are you actually looking at when you consider these budgets? You're considering the poorer sections of the community and particularly women who you think are adversely affected, is that right? Yes, we saw some figures earlier about the impact of different sorts of tax cuts on taxpayers in general. If we start to look at men and women separately, we see quite different pictures. And that's because women are in general in quite different situations to, to men. Exactly. But what are you saying? That, the, that the, there is a balance to be redressed? We're saying that it's important to look at the impact of uh, tax cuts on men and women uh, to, to see to what extent they're different because it's important to know what's happening to men and women. For example, if uh, the Chancellor was to cut the basic rate of tax, 74% of the giveaway that he would be uh, producing would go to men and only 26% to women. On the other hand, if he was to increase the personal allowance, the figures would be slightly different. 62% would go to men and 38% to women. So although uh, it, tax cuts are obviously important for everybody, the differential effect on men and women is quite different. K Kerry Oppenheim, I know you're also doing this um, study. Do you take account of the fact that many men are fathers looking after families and supporting them and perhaps supporting a woman or a spouse within the family and therefore it's not quite as outrageous as might seem at first glance? Well, yes, of course, um, some men are looking after children, but the, the bulk of uh, people who are spending time out of paid work looking after children are women. So I think it is useful to distinguish the, you know, the impact between men and women. I mean, one of the crucial things in terms of tackling poverty and child poverty would be uh, improving women's access to paid work. Um, uh, women also spend more of their money on children's uh, uh, needs and, and the home's needs. So we need to think about ways of encouraging uh, women into work through measures like child benefit, uh, tackling some of the disincentives in means-tested benefits and subsidised childcare. So you'd like to see if the Chancellor gives, a, gives money away, you'd like it on allowances and child benefit and those sort of things that have a direct impact equally on men and women. Well, child benefit on women, of course. Yes, well, on, on, on families with children, but, but not on the married couples allowance. Um, we would not want the Chancellor to kind of cave in to pressure to um, boost married couples allowance, because in most cases the married couples allowance goes to the man, and given the fact that women tend to spend more of their money on children, it's important to get money into women's pockets. Um, so we would prefer him to, to, to redirect those resources uh, towards children and carers. Are you against the, the married couples alliance in principle? Well, I think in a, in a society where there are, all, there are many different kinds of families, we've got to look at the best ways of supporting children within those families. At the moment, married couples allowance will go to those who um, don't have children, uh, and some of those people are, are at the better uh, kind of earnings end. So, so we need to think about, in the government's language, targeting uh, money in the, in the most useful way. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope we'll be able to hear from you later after the budget to see how you react to it, but thanks for joining us. Now, uh, Peter, can we have a look at the, at the state of the economy and move on to that and the parameters which the Chancellor is dealing with? A few months ago, David, I mean, it would have been quite hard to find an indicator that wasn't looking quite favourable for the economy. But, Peter Jay, everybody has been hinting uh, at the one that's worrying them now, and it is, of course, growth. Uh, again, for the last three years, things have looked fairly rosy. You have to go right back to 1991 to remember the recession, minus 1.5, negative growth in the last quarter of 1991. Popping through the 
zero point here and just at the end of 92, 0.4% in the last quarter. And then, of course, rocketing up to a peak of something like four, over 4%. Four but then look what's happened. Now, I rang Goldman Sachs, who were giving us their forecasts uh, for the next year, only two weeks ago. And this figure for the last quarter of 1995, they were saying, was 2.2% estimated growth in the last quarter of 1995. Their estimate now for next year, for next year, is that there will be a trough down to 1% here, 1% growth for the first two quarters of 1996. And that, of course, reflected unemployment. When you look at unemployment, crashing down from 2.9 million, 2.8 over the last three years, just the kind of picture the government wanted to see. Goldman Sachs, two weeks ago, that would have gone down to 2.2 by the end of 96. Look what they're forecasting now. 2.4 well, million. As uh, Peter does the sums for the Chancellor, here's the Chancellor himself coming out of number 11. Right. Uh, with Gillian, his wife, and the budget box to the photographers outside in Downing Street. The uh, brief pause for the photographers here. This is his third budget. He's been before this at Home Secretary. He's been at Education. He was Secretary of State for Health. He's 55 years old. His uh, family came from uh, Nottingham Colliery, where his father was a colliery electrician. He was educated at Nottingham High School, D.H. Lawrence's old school. He went to Cambridge and read law. He was the chairman of the Cambridge University Conservative Association, part of the so-called Cambridge Mafia. They were all friends in those days. Leon Britton, Norman Lamont, former chancellor, Norman Fowler, Michael Howard, and John Gummer was his best man when the Clark couple were married and his reputation as Chancellor is that he's somewhat suspected by the right wing of the Tory party for his views on Europe and the ERM and his style is swashbuckling compared with some former Chancellors. His uh, discussions with Eddie George, the Governor of the Bank of England, on interest rates, a great interest. Uh, we remember earlier in the year he refused to increase interest rates when Eddie George said they should be and says that he was vindicated. So a rumbustious figure who likes jazz and smoking cigars and going to the football match and doesn't care too much of his own appearance. And the man who said at the conference this year in Blackpool, so far this parliament we've given you the hors d'oeuvre, not the main course. Well, we have to see what happens when he gets to the House of Commons and begins his statement round about half past three this afternoon. Well, uh, let's go now and look at, uh, at chancellors in general and this conundrum that the chancellor has, which we've been talking about here the extent to which he does things purely for the economy, the extent to which he does things for his own supporters to win the next election. Uh, we sent John Pina, P Pina our uh, political correspondent, to go and talk to three former chancellors who've been in the same position that Kenneth Clark is in. That's to say, who've had to introduce budgets shortly before a general election. And he got their views on uh, the problems facing Kenneth Clark. Lord Jenkins was a scrupulously cautious Labour Chancellor. He says former colleagues should work on their history before blaming him for losing in 1970. That is absolute nonsense, as a matter of fact, there, because people at that stage certainly were very disillusioned with election bribes clawed back afterwards. You have had a great tradition, I'm afraid, of rather improvident um, conservative chancellors. Blame, not always fair, was the lot of chancellors after election defeats. Kenneth Clark, please note. Well, I think it's probably got rather worse for him at the moment because you have this obsessive um, tax-cutting, tax-cutting, tax promising um, climate moment to an extent I've hardly ever seen before. He's got a certain amount of guts and he's got a certain amount of conviction which he'll fight for more than most other ministers. But this, this, this budget this budget, with the Conservatives in a very weak position, with an election coming up fairly soon, maybe not within the next year, but could be very likely within the next year or so, he's subject to tremendous temptation. I think that he'll, if he submits the temptation, he'll, I don't think he'll win the election, and I think he'll regret having done so. So the job of Chancellor isn't one to be envied uh, before an election if you happen to be an honest man. The sand castles you build are almost all washed away, and washed away quite quickly by the high tide of your successor. Sand castles or not, Lord Healy's inclined to defend his record. 
He denies playing politics in any budget, including 1974, with one election over and another rushing up. He says buying votes has always been a game played by the other side. I've only seen that happen with Tory uh, chancellors like uh, uh, Lamont, um, going further back, Maudling and Barber, who really made a mess of it. Uh, Labour chancellors, Cripps, Gateskill, Jenkins and me have never played fast and loose because we know, in fact, that the public in elections is not very much influenced by a penny or two on or off the income tax. You may remember that before I became Chancellor, I warned my party that I'd have to raise taxes and we won the election. In drawing up this budget, do you believe Kenneth Clark would lean more towards protecting his economic reputation than in trying to deliver political results? I have the impression that he's very shrewd politically as well as economically and he knows that he and his party will gain nothing if he plays ducks and drakes with the economy in the hope that that will transform the prospects of the most unpopular government in this British history. Norman Lamott could testify that glory is an elusive commodity at the Treasury. VAT on fuel may have ended in tears, but he insists his pre-election budget contributed heavily to the victory of 1992, whether or not people are inclined to remember the fact. I think it did play a part in winning the election in two ways. Firstly, it led into the election theme of the Conservatives being the party that would cut taxes. And it, of course, was delivered on the night almost of the election campaign beginning. So it created an issue right from the start that led into the theme of the campaign. Secondly, the budget itself had one particular measure, the introduction of a lower rate band, a new starting point of 20%, which put the Labour Party on the spot. And they'd no idea whether they were for or against it. They were against cutting taxes. But this, on the face of it, appeared to help their voters quite a lot. And therefore, they were completely at sixes and sevens in how to react to it. And I remember vividly, Neil Kinnock being completely unable to say whether he was for or against it during his immediate reaction to the budget. So I think it threw them. To what extent do you believe the Chancellor can use this budget to turn around the fortunes of the party? Only to a limited extent, but perhaps a very important extent he can help. Let me say firstly that I think there will be more of what people call a feel-good factor next year, because I think the progressive tightening of tax increases, which has been at the root of the government's unpopularity, which was necessary, but has been seen as a, uh, a reversal of government policy, that obviously has been very unpopular, but that is ending. And next year, we will see disposable take-home pay rising more quickly. So I think even before there are any changes in this budget, consumers are going to feel a lot better off next year anyway. I think he can do something to help that perception that things are better by having some affordable, prudent tax cuts, which is what I'm sure he will do because, because he has sensibly been a very cautious chancellor, as we all like to be. Uh, we're joined now by Robin Oakley, the BBC's political editor. Robin, are we really to believe that they're as um, careful as that and uh, do nothing to curry favour with voters? Well, no, chancellors before elections do have to take account of the political factor. But this is a chancellor who's in a cleft strip, really, because as much as he's got to cheer up Tory morale by producing tax cuts, he knows that this government is suffering not just from the loss of the trust factor on its taxation record, uh, but from the very question of its economic competence. The time when the government dived in the opinion polls was when they were forced out of the exchange rate mechanism of the European monetary system. That was seen as a huge reversal of their economic policy. They've never recovered from that moment. And therefore, he's got to show in anything that he does in this budget that he is competently managing the economy, that he's not upsetting the city, that he's not producing anything which could have an adverse effect, say, on interest rates. And he's got to balance that against the political need to lift the morale of his party uh, and to encourage some kind of 
feel-good factor, which can probably only be done by something which gives a pretty cheerful headline. That's why a lot of Tory MPs are going about today saying, uh, to pee or not to pee, that is the question. <laughs> because they think one pee on, uh, off the standard rate of income tax won't be enough. OK, Peter Jay, uh, do you believe in Chancellor's rectitude that we saw on display a moment ago? Well, the only precedent for that was Stafford Cripps in 1950, who actually refused, told actually he would not introduce the budget if uh, he held the election after the budget, and forced actually to hold the election in February of that year, which was a disastrous month for the Labour Party and which wiped out Labour's huge majority. The other interesting precedent is Roy Jenkins. Contrary to what he said, I suspect that if he had introduced the kind of budget that Ken Clark will, announcing tax reductions over the next four or five years, thereby uh, preempting the opposition party, he might have won the 1970 election. So chances can certainly lose elections. Whether they can win them, as Norman Lamont uh, says, is more arguable. A lot hangs on how much the Chancellor decides to borrow today, and let's talk about that because we've had general discussion about it. Peter, what are the options he's got on borrowing? Peter Snow. Well, let's look at the constraints on borrowing then. The public sector borrowing requirement, everybody's been talking about it, it's the difference between what the Chancellor draws in in taxes and spends in spending plans. And here is the story of the PSBR as presented by the Chancellor in November last year at the time of the last budget. Now, that huge borrowing requirement there, as it's called, that PSBR, that difference between revenue and expenditure, 1995-6, the current financial year, was 21.5 forecast by the Chancellor in November last year. 13 billion was the PSBR, the borrowing requirement he reckoned he'd have to have in the year for which he's budgeting today, uh, dropping down here, dropping right down to the line here with one billion below the line, one billion here, which he could repay the national debt with by the year 2000. So things looking quite rosy and a very much a downhill trend. Now, come the decline in the growth factor and come the slowdown in the economy by the summer, his summer forecast was suggesting that things were looking a little less good. 23.6 billion, the borrowing requirement, he reckoned, for 95.6. The coming year up to 16 billion, the borrowing requirement, without any tax changes, 5.5 billion uh, in 77.8, and then on down there. Now, Goldman Sachs, who are doing the forecasting for us in the city, they reckon that at the moment, even without any tax changes, the borrowing requirement for the current year is up to 28 billion. 17 billion for the coming year for which he's budgeting this time, 11 billion, and this time, 3 billion borrowing requirement even as far away as 98.9. Now, that's the one to watch. And the question is, how much can he, in net terms, increase that 17 billion PSBR for next year without getting into dangerous waters. Now, as purely a ballpark figure, and I'm sure Peter Jay will talk about one quite different, 20 billion is about the 3.5%, which is thought to be, by most of the pundits, as the sort of sustainable level of borrowing, 2.5% of national output. 25 billion would be the top end, about the 3%, the sort of Maastricht criteria and so on. So anything up to 20 billion, people might say, well, that's all right. Above 20 billion, he's beginning to get into risky waters, according to many economic pundits. And Peter Jay may argue with that. David. Peter, thanks so much. Well, now, let, let me bring in John Whiting, who's a regular on these programs now, tax partner of Price Waterhouse, keeps an eye on all the figures and will be explaining any of the changes in income tax after the budget statement is over. But just on this point of what the Chancellor can do and on what kind of risk he can afford to take on borrowing, what's your opinion? I think he can afford to take a bit of a risk and therefore give away a bit, as people are saying, and that probably points to, as Peter Snow was saying at the start, net tax cuts of three, four, possibly even five billion. But actually, I'm rather expecting that slipped in with some of the tax cuts, which will be headlined with uh, income tax cuts, there'll be a bit of a take with excise duties, the beer, perhaps the uh, cigarettes, possibly even a little VAT increase. That would be a bit of a wild card, but uh, to show he's got a bit of fiscal rectitude for the city. Steve Barrow in the city with a chemical bank. Uh, everybody's very frightened of your reaction. We're always told we have to keep an eye out for city reaction. What do you think he can do? Are you worried about what might happen to interest rates or inflation if he gives away too much? Well, we're certainly worried about the prospects for lower interest rates if uh, he plays fast and loose with the budget. I think that many people in the city feel that if the economy is slowing down, as the evidence currently suggests, if the Chancellor's worried about that slowdown, as I think he is, then he should really be cutting interest rates and not really cutting taxes dramatically in order to try and strengthen the economy. So we'd be looking today basically for a budget which is broadly neutral, that any tax cuts are paid for by spending cuts, and in the very near future he can follow that up by cutting interest rates. Well, what would you do if uh, he put another nine billion back into the economy, as Peter Jay was talking about, to give it a boost? What well, would the city reaction be to that? Well, panic in a word. 
Um, I mean, uh, I think that there are certainly some people in the city who do share Peter Jay's view. There's a, a widespread of opinion, but I think if you want to take the average market view, they're really looking for tax cuts more in the three to four billion area, and I think that nine billion would be way too much for the city. Thanks very much. Well, Alan Amy is the uh, director of uh, LDV up in Birmingham. What do you want from this budget? You've heard what's been suggested, but from a businessman's point of view, wanting to export your vehicles, what do you need? I need a commitment to the longer term. I'm very, very concerned as we look at the, uh, the budget today that we're looking at short-term issues and short-term stimulation of the economy. I'm looking for a much longer-term view, and what I'd like to see is that Ken Clark would, would put the country first and perhaps politics second. We talk about tax cuts. I wonder really whether the public, certainly myself, people that work here, are looking for tax cuts rather than looking for a commitment to training, to development, to stimulate the economy generally. Do you want a, a straight stimulus to the economy in the form of more money put into it? I, I'm sorry, I didn't do, hear that. Do you want a straight stimulus to the economy out of today in the, in the form of more money put into it? I don't think the economy is too bad, actually. Uh, inflation is down, interest rates are coming down. I think we've got steady growth. I actually think the economy is not doing too badly. I think steady as she goes is the issue. Steady as she goes and look at diverting some of the funds that are currently available into areas that will stimulate the longer term growth rather than the short term. We've got a couple of minutes before we go down to the House of Commons for Prime Minister's questions at 3.15, which we'll do. We'll then take the budget statement and we'll then hear from the leader of the opposition, Tony Blair, not the whole of his speech, but the opening part of it, because uh, the main response by Labour is given tomorrow. But we'll be recording that speech and we'll turn around bits of it. So that's what we're doing in a minute or two from now. But before we do that, Ruth Lee, what's your reaction to everything you've heard so far in this? And, uh, well, I stick to my basic view that fiscal rectitude is absolutely central. But I wonder if we're actually getting a bit too pessimistic now about the economy. Sure enough, the latest numbers have looked very poor. GDP grew very little in the third quarter. Manufacturing output seems to be down. Retail sales hasn't grown for 18 months. But next year, there will be some stimuluses to the economy. Uh, I expect interest rate cuts. There'll be some pickup in global growth. That will help our exports. And I think, finally, we, there are quite a lot of windfalls coming the consumer's way. After all, the wrecks are going to give 50 quid away to everybody. And there are things like uh, the Halifax Leeds uh, merger, which is going to turn into a PLC, and there's going to be a lot of handouts. And those windfalls could be quite sizable. So let's not get too pessimistic. I think that's what I'd say. Is it true that the Halifax windfall is as much as the Chancellor may be giving away today? There's going to be something like five billion well, to seven billion put back into the economy? Well, absolutely. If you take them all together, because I think you know, Leeds is going to merge with the TSB, and I think it's Cheltenham and Gloucester as well. When you take all those windfalls together, you're probably talking about a good deal more than five billion, more like ten billion. So three building societies are more powerful than the Chancellor of the Checker. And the, um, the national grid flotation as well. Right. When you take them all together. Well, we'll, we'll so come, we'll come not back. Too not too despondent. We'll come back and, and talk about all that in a moment. In the meantime, let's now go down to the House of Commons. Uh, we join Rob Orchard, who's our uh, commentator there today, to set the scene before Prime Minister's questions. Rob. Thank you, David. Well, a few moments ago, the Prime Minister and Tony Blair both entered the chamber. Uh, Tony Blair and Mr. Major had a brief word behind the Speaker's chair. They were all smiles. Then Tony Blair waited while John Major took his place on the government front bench before he took his place, both of them to rousing cheers from their own supporters. We're now just ending defence questions. The Defence Minister, Mr. Soames, who's been the centre of some controversy himself, has been answering questions. He even referred in slightly uh, quick mode to his comments about paranoia of the Princess of Wales interview. He said that one of the Labour MPs was clearly suffering from paranoia and people seem to take that in light-hearted mood today. So in a few moments, this very packed chamber will be hearing Prime Minister's questions before the budget statement. Uh, Mr Major today celebrating five years since he actually became Prime Minister. The Commons was uh, particularly full for defence questions. Uh, beforehand, many MPs were taking their places before prayers at half past two and the benches were, uh, we could see a whole series of the little green player cards which uh, book their places. Now the first question, Prime Minister's question is from the Scottish nationalist Margaret Ewing. This morning I presided at a meeting of the Cabinet and had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall be having further meetings later today. Mrs Ewing. Madam Speaker, whilst recognising the very significant role the Prime Minister has played in the Northern Ireland peace process, he will understand there is now widespread concern at what appears to be an impasse. In these circumstances, does he now feel it is time 
to establish an international commission to help move matters on. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm grateful to what the Honourable Lady had to say in her uh, opening remarks. I naturally hope we'll soon be able to launch what has become known as the Twin Track Initiative. I've had further conversation with the Irish Prime Minister earlier today. I expect to speak to him later on this afternoon. There are still some important points outstanding, and it's too soon to say whether uh, and when we might reach agreement, but some progress has been made. Neville Trotter. <laughs> Remind my right honourable friend of the massive Siemens plant building at this time on Tyneside. Yeah, yeah. Is he aware that with £1,100 million of German money, this is the biggest investment in Europe? And is he aware that with 700 million planned exports every year, the plant could have gone anywhere in the world? And is not the decision to put it on Tyneside with the thousands of jobs that result a tribute and proof of the attractiveness of Britain, of the soundness of the economy, and of the success of government policies? Yeah. Well, it is certainly uh, a very welcome investment, Madam Speaker, as indeed is all the inward investment that we've seen over recent years. What is very refreshing is that we're receiving inward investment not just from outside the European Union, where we have had the bulk of inward investment into Western Europe for many years, but also reinvestment from one part of the European Union to the United Kingdom. And I think that does reflect our tax structure, the opportunities in this country, the fact that we are not committed to very high social costs, and the skills of the British workforce. Tony Blair. Uh, Madam Speaker, does the Prime Minister recall giving a firm pledge that after rail privatisation, fares would be capped? How is it then that we're now told that only 20% of intercity lines and 40% of the rest will be capped? Well, let me say to the right honourable gentleman, we remain committed to fares rising in line with inflation over the next three years, then falling 1% below inflation for the next four years. That is capping of fares. The right honourable gentleman will recall, of course, that when Labour were last in government, well, yes, Madam Speaker. It was a long time ago, and it, it was because they were so appalling in government that it has been such a long time ago. And when they were in government, rail fares rose by over 22 per cent over and above inflation. And the fact is that fares would go up again under Labour to pay for their policy of renationalisation. Mr Blair. Madam Speaker, he didn't answer the question as to why the pledge that he gave is no longer being honoured. And now that we know that I think it's an extra £700 million worth of public subsidy is going to these railway networks after privatisation, hundreds of millions of pounds being spent on the sale, a report today that it may be sold for a quarter of its book value, a loss to the taxpayer of billions of pounds, isn't it time in those circumstances, if he can't even maintain the pledges he's given, that the sale is dropped and it's kept as a proper public service? The right honourable gentleman is wrong all the way down the line. I assume, I assume, I assume he's getting advice from the deputy leader. But he's clearly wrong with all his facts. I've made the point about the maintenance of uh, fares rising in line with inflation and then falling. I've made that point perfectly clear again to the right honourable gentleman. As far as the sale of rail tracks concerned, there's no question of rail tracks assets being sold off cheaply. But the pricing. Well, Madam Speaker, we saw a few days ago the Labour Party's briefing on a budget they haven't yet heard. Here, here we now hear them scoffing at decisions that haven't yet been taken. How do they know? They don't know. What they are in the business of doing, what they are in the business of doing is trying to smear this privatisation as they have tried to smear every privatisation in the past. Um, Roger Gale. Madam Speaker, I'm sure that my right honourable friend will welcome the news that the videotape made from recordings culled from clandestine cameras has been withdrawn from sale. Would he ask my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, to consider prosecution as this tape was illegal and uncertificated? And would he consider the prospect of the confiscation of the proceeds of sale? Would he also seek to prevent further such events so that CCTV cameras, which are a valuable weapon in the fight against crime, are not brought into disrepute? 
Well, I will see that my right honourable friend considers my honourable friend's remarks. Mr. Paddy Ashdown. Having been, having been fooled, <laughs> Madam Speaker, having having been fooled by tax promises before the last election, followed by record tax hikes after it. Why does the Prime Minister believe that the British people will be taken in twice on taxes by his government? Well, the uh, <coughs> right honourable gentleman finds himself in a rather curious situation. He has consistently in the uh, past opposed uh, tax increases. Now he opposes the possibility of tax reductions. Yeah. It is, of course, a typical Liberal position, both to oppose one thing and oppose the precise opposite. What the right honourable gentleman, whom we welcome safely to his place today, what, Paddy Ashton what had, a, the, had a close encounter with someone right wielding a knife. What the right honourable gentleman neglects to mention is that uh, take-home pay after inflation has risen since I became Prime Minister by over £600 a year in today's uh, prices, that real disposable income is £400 a year per head higher in today's prices, and that in addition average mortgage costs have fallen by £140 a month. Do you like? Uh, further to the first supplementary question, would my right honourable friend not agree that uh, the government's careful and meticulous policy on Northern Ireland peace talks has the full bipartisan support of all parties in this House. But nonetheless, there is a very strong collective desire for further progress from now on. Could he say a little bit more following his previous answer on the prospects after the American President's visit to Britain and the island of Ireland tomorrow? Uh, well, I'm grateful to what my uh, honourable friend had to say uh, further to the honourable lady's remarks. Um, as I indicated earlier, I hope to speak to the Irish Prime Minister again later on this afternoon. I am not certain on that occasion whether we will be able to reach full agreement, but if we do not, then we will consider, continue at a later stage to see whether an agreement on acceptable terms is possible. I do emphasise to the House the agreement has to be on acceptable terms. It has to be an agreement that is going to lay the groundwork that would enable all parties in due course to get together and talk. There is no purpose in an agreement that will not work and will not achieve that. So I think we do have to deal with it carefully. We do have to consider the position of uh, all parties who have expressed views on the matter. And I will deal with it uh, as speedily as is practicable, but only with the determination of reaching a satisfactory settlement. As soon as we can reach one, we'll announce it. If we can't, then we will continue to seek one. Mr Thomas McAvoy. Number two, Madam Speaker. I refer the Honourable Gentleman to the reply I gave some moments ago. McAvoy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A moment ago, the Prime Minister mentioned mortgage payments, but dealing with other statistics, can he confirm that in the five years since he took office as Prime Minister, no fewer than 320,000 families have lost their homes through repossession, and the current repossession rate is running at over 1,000 per week? Is that a record he is proud of? Or will he take this opportunity to apologise to these families for the misery it has caused them, or is it all their own fault? Well, I can, cert I can certainly reconfirm the point I made earlier, and also confirm the point that uh, repossessions are falling. What is most necessary for the housing market? What is most necessary for the housing market is stable inflation, stable inflation, and the lowest possible interest rates. And we have achieved a better position on inflation than we had seen for generations and a better position on interest rates than we've seen for very many years. That bodes very well for the housing market. Mr. Richard Tracy. Uh, Madam Speaker, does my right honourable friend uh, share a sense of intrigue with me at the speech yesterday of Commissioner Kinnock that major events in Europe were unlikely to happen until well after 1999? And does he agree with me that this was not so much a, a statement of the policy of the European Commission, more an indication of the state of nerves of the British Labour Party? Mr Kinnock's been wrapped over the knuckles by the EC Commission President Jacques Santer. Well, suggesting a single currency wouldn't I, come by 1999. My honourable friend draws uh, attention to a very intriguing speech. And uh, like every other member of the House, I read it with a great deal of interest. Uh, I believe Commissioner Kinnock is approaching this matter with a greater clarity of vision than right honourable gentleman on the opposition front bench. Yeah. 
And I think what he has had to say is to have had the audacity to admit what we have been saying for ages, that Europe may not well be ready for a single currency in 1999, and that if it is not ready, to proceed without all of Europe being ready would be disastrous not just for individual countries, but for every country in the European Union. Mr. Brian Davis. I refer the honourable gentleman to the reply I gave some moments ago. Davis. How can our nation be at ease with itself, an ambition the Prime Minister set five years ago, when one in five non-pensioner households has nobody working? Uh, I have to say to the uh, honourable gentleman that I think that what one needs to ensure that a nation is at ease with itself is a range of different factors that we are now producing. And I will tell the honourable gentleman what they are. First, the smashing of the inflationary psychology and the protection of pensioners' savings. Second, the best economic outlook for generations, which we now have. Third, the largest fall in crime, in recorded crime for over 40 years, which we now have. The lowest rate of unemployment among large nations in Europe, which we now have. And a range of other factors which this government has put in place and which no earlier Labour government matched in any way. Simon Coombs. Number four, Madam Speaker. And the Chancellor's finally arrived in the chamber, standing quietly behind the Speaker's chair, waiting his turn for his budget in a moment. My right honourable friend has seen the news today that uh, Honda Motor Company is proposing to create 500 new jobs at its plant in Swindon. Is this not, is this not excellent news for the motor industry in this country, which was on its knees under the last Labour government, yeah. how, how, would the prospects, how would the prospects for investment such as this be affected if Britain were to sign up for the European Social Chapter as advocated by the party opposite? Yeah. Well, I join, my, I join my honourable friend in welcoming this news. I think it is good for Britain and I have no doubt that it is good for my honourable friend's constituents. Uh, they join the workers of Black & Decker uh, in Sedgefield. Uh, they join the workers of NEC in Livingston. They join the workers of B Sky B in Dunfermline, all of whom had benefited as a result of that sort of investment, and that sort of investment would not have taken place but for the success of this government's economic policy and this government's other policies. The reality is that signing up to the social chapter will add unnecessary costs to employers and put our record for inward investment at risk. And honourable members opposite shake their heads, but they know that the social chapter is not a pick and mix option, as the Leader of the Opposition says. Once you've signed up to it, you've got it. And if you have it, you will, might well not have those sorts of investments. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. John Speller. Number five, Madam Speaker. I refer the honourable gentleman to the reply I gave some moments ago. Mr. Speller. On the fifth anniversary of his premiership, how does the Prime Minister justify having doubled the national debt during that period? I think if the honourable gentleman looks at the record of successive Labour governments, he might wish to withdraw that question. And what he will see is that we finance our borrowing properly. The last Labour government sought the last Labour government increased debt by an unprecedented amount. Mr Wilshire. Further to my right honourable friend's earlier understandably cautious replies about Northern Ireland, can he confirm that a start to decommissioning remains a precondition of any all-party talks in Northern Ireland? Well, those who have read the Building Blocks paper that we published recently will see that it sets down specific requirements for the body's report and sets out also that the international body was not being established to make recommendations on when decommissioning should start. That position has not changed. That was a question from David Wilshire, Conservative. Presentation of Bill, Secretary Sir George Young. Now, this is the formal reintroduction of a bill to allow the building of a Channel Tunnel rail link from London to the port of Folkestone. Consideration will continue of that bill from where it left off in the last session of Parliament. Now, the Chancellor ready to deliver his budget. We understand from the Treasury he'll be drinking scotch, the only time that uh, alcohol is allowed in the chamber. 
And Ken Clark has his budget speech already out, so uh, he won't be suffering the fate of George Ward Hunt in the 19th century, who opened the budget box to deliver to his discover to his horror and embarrassment that he'd left his speech at home. For the Exchequer, it may be for the convenience of honourable members if I remind them that at the end of the Chancellor's speech, copies of the budget resolutions will be available to honourable members in the vote office. Mr. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman of uh, Ways and Means, uh, I've already said publicly that I've been looking forward to this year's budget. Uh, I, I'm enjoying each budget a little more as I get uh, nearer to my aims. And the aims are very worthwhile ones. The British economy has now been growing for almost four years. The recovery has created more than half a million new jobs. We have more of our people in work than in any other major country in the European Union. Inflation is enjoying its best run for almost 50 years. All the major Western economies have slowed down this year, but our recovery remains stronger than most. The IMF has forecast that next year we will be joint top with Germany of the G7 Growth League table. Few chancellors, Mr Chairman, have delivered their budget against a background of such strong economic fundamentals. Yeah. But getting this far has not been easy. It's required tough decisions on tax and spending over the past three years. This budget builds on the hard-won gains this government has made, and it keeps Britain on course to be the enterprise centre of Europe. Yeah. A Britain that creates more jobs, and generates the greater wealth and personal prosperity in which we can all share. A Britain in which everyone can keep more of what they earn or save, to spend as they choose, not as the state chooses. Yeah. A Britain where more money is spent on the things that everyone cares about. Our schools, our hospitals, our police. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The people of this country believe in these goals. Only this government is committed to the means of achieving them. Yeah. We're keeping inflation low. We're keeping control of public spending. We're keeping government borrowing on a downward path. And we believe, we believe in the policies of low taxation, which all countries must follow if they want to be world-class economic powers. Well, the people of Middle England, Middle Scotland, Middle Wales, Middle Ulster, they understand that these policies address their needs and meet their concerns in a rapidly changing and ever more competitive world. These are the people of Britain who are hardworking and take responsibility for themselves and their families. The people who want to get on in life, who run their own businesses and who create jobs. And the people with that great British virtue, a social conscience, who want to see a successful... People with, people with a real social conscience who want to see a successful economy first earn the wealth in order to give the weak and the less fortunate a helping hand. This budget addresses the aspirations of the people of this country in an economically and socially responsible way. It controls public spending overall while shifting more money towards schools, hospitals and the police. It keeps government borrowing on a clear downward path and fiscal policy tight so that the recovery will be sustained. And it cuts taxes. For all these reasons, that's why I've been looking forward to this year's budget. Before moving on to specific tax and spending measures, let me deal briefly with the economic background. In 1994, the economy grew by around 4%, fueled by the success of British exporters overseas. No mature industrial economy could easily sustain these rates of growth without risking a rise in inflation. That's why towards the end of last year, I raised interest rates. In the event, slower growth in the world economy has reduced the growth of British exports. British exporters are well placed to compete in markets overseas. For example, Mr Chairman, we now have a current account surplus with the so-called tiger economies of Southeast Asia. Uh, but our key markets in America and Europe are growing by less than they were in 1994. But growth in this country will be sustained.
because the fundamentals of the economy are strong as a result of our economic policies. We have low inflation, sound public finances and more competitive businesses. The change in the pace of growth this year isn't unique to Britain. It's been seen in the United States and Germany and elsewhere. No recovery ever proceeds at a constant rate of growth throughout. In fact, this recovery is proving to be the steadiest seen in Britain for a generation. Many commentators confidently predicted that the higher tax and lower public spending of the last three budgets would knock the recovery off track. They were wrong. Consumer spending has been on a firm upward trend since the recovery began. With the necessary tax increases behind us, consumer spending should grow further next year and the year after. Businesses have responded to the economic recovery by investing for the future. Manufacturing investment has grown by 12% over the past year. The conditions for further increases in investment, low inflation, low interest rates, low corporate tax rates, and healthy company balance sheets remain in place. So for the economy as a whole, the forecasts, which I'm publishing in the Red Book, are for growth of two and three quarter percent this year and three percent next year. And my last two budgets have strengthened the foundations of the economy and put the recovery onto a secure footing. I've reduced public spending and borrowing plans to create more room for the wealth creating part of the economy to grow. I've helped businesses and I've improved the workings of the labor market. The decisions I took and the policies I pursued in those budgets have helped to reduce pressure on me to increase interest rates further without jeopardizing my inflation target. We've got inflation under control. Inflation's picked up over the past years. The impact of last year's worldwide increase in commodity prices has fed through the price chain. These cost pressures are now steadily easing. Underlying inflation may be close to its peak and should resume its downward path during the course of next year. It remains on course to meet the government's target of 2.5% or below by the end of the present parliament. The House uh, might care to remember that last August was the 20th anniversary of inflation in this country reaching a staggering 26.9%. <laughs> So we've got inflation under control. We've also got the public finances under control. The government has delivered last year's tough public spending plans. Indeed, we expect to undershoot them. However, tax receipts have come in lower than expected this year. This is partly due to lower inflation and to lower growth. The public sector borrowing requirement is the difference between two enormous numbers so that forecasts for public borrowing have always been notoriously difficult to make. They always have been. Under whatever party. Because it's difficult, I've therefore been cautious. I've been prudent this year in setting out the latest projections for the PSBR. Uh, I now expect the PSBR to be £29 billion in the current financial year. Well, that will be £7 billion less than last year and £16 billion less than two years ago. And I'm determined to follow a consistent course and I've taken more public spending decisions to keep it that way. I've no intention of throwing away the gains we've made in recent years in getting public borrowing down. We'll keep on track towards balance in the medium term because I don't want the future strength of the recovery put at risk. Overall, our decisions on public spending and the tax measures I shall describe shortly will be broadly neutral in their impact on the downward path for the PSBR over the next three years. And this downward profile for government borrowing sets the overall framework for my budget this year. I'm not prepared to take any action which would put at risk my fiscal target of moving towards balance in the medium term. I had to make the difficult judgments and decisions about the balance between the levels of taxation and public spending. This year, as in previous years, I've made those judgments and taken those decisions with the dominant priority of improving the long-term health of the British economy. 
Our tax and spending policies must promote our aim of becoming the enterprise centre of Europe. In each of my three budgets, I have reduced public spending plans substantially. And this year, I have once again kept a firm grip on public spending, helped by my right honourable friend, the Chief Secretary. Yeah. Uh, my right honourable friend and I have at least uh, three things in common. Uh, we have both been in charge of very big spending departments, so we are both uh, poachers turned gamekeepers. I think neither of us could be described as adopting the slash and burn approach to public spending. But we are both convinced that the share of national income taken by the state in public expenditure must be reduced to below 40% if we are to remain competitive in today's world. It is essential to give the private sector more room to generate the jobs, the investment and the wealth that will make people and their families more prosperous. And this goes hand in hand with our commitment to a modern welfare state. In the rapidly changing world of technological advance and a more flexible labour market, the British people need to be prepared and equipped to embrace change in a flexible way. They will be more willing to do this if they know that high quality schools, health care and a safety net for the unemployed, the disabled and the old are there if and when they need them. That's why we're modernising the welfare state, so that it underpins the British economy and doesn't undermine it. We're changing the welfare state to ensure that it serves the needs of today, not of 40 years ago. That it serves those who genuinely need it and that it's affordable to the taxpayer. Now, these objectives are being achieved in the face of huge pressures for higher public spending that come rolling in year after year. But this budget proves that we can have good quality public services and spending control. Unlike our critics, we understand that good services depend not only on how much you spend, but on the way that you spend it. So this realistic but socially responsible approach has guided me this year. I have limited the growth of spending overall, but I have also provided more money for the public services the British people care about most, schools, hospitals and the police. And it is to pay for this that my right honourable friend, the Chief Secretary and I have found savings elsewhere from our continuing drive to modernise government. So let me deal first with the priority areas where I have been able to increase spending plans. Firstly, in, in no case were any of them cut last year. <laughs> no, 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 no. An, an ill thought out and inaccurate interjection. Let me turn to what we are doing to the National Health Service. This government is committed to the National Health Service. I am proud that since 1979 spending on the NHS has increased by over 70 per cent in real terms. We are continuing to deliver our commitment to increase spending on the NHS in real terms. That is what we said we would do and we are doing it. Public spending on the National Health Service will increase by over a billion pounds next year. In addition, patients will benefit from improvements in efficiency including reductions in NHS management costs. All those savings, around £650 million pounds next year, will be ploughed back into patient care. And privately financed projects will bring nearly £700 million pounds of extra investment over the next three years, without in any way undermining the fundamental principle that health care should be free at the point of service. It's no no, it's no good the word private producing curls on the lips of the party opposite. This money is on top of the additional £1 billion worth of public expenditure and it all represents additional resources for our free National Health Service. Next schools. This budget allows for spending on schools to rise next year. We have already increased spending per pupil by some 50 per cent in real terms since 1979. We in this country devote a higher proportion of our public spending to education than they do in Japan, Germany or France. Our achievements have been impressive. Post-16 staying on rates have risen dramatically from 42 per cent in 1979 to 72 per cent now. 
Almost one in three young people go on to higher education, up from one in eight in 1979. We have the highest graduation rate of any major European country. We've achieved many improvements in our schools, introduction of the national curriculum, more rigorous schools inspection, measures to tackle failing schools, greater choice for parents, better vocational education, and extension of free nursery education. This isn't just good for our children, it's good for our future, and it's good for our economy. Our reforms have delivered better standards of education for each pound that we spend, but we're also spending more pounds. The plans I'm publishing today allow for an increase in spending on schools of 878 million pounds. Within this, over 770 million pounds will be channeled through the local authority settlement. Parents will rightly expect local authorities to carry this funding through to school budgets. Yeah. And parents should ask their local authorities how this extra money for schools will be spent on their children. Next, the police service. Since 1979, spending on our police has almost doubled, even after allowing for inflation. Next year, the resources available to fight crime will be increased again. Money is being provided for an extra 5,000 police officers over the next three years. This is on top of the 32,000 increase in the police service since 1979. The plans also allow for an extra 10,000 closed-circuit television cameras in town centres and elsewhere. I've found these extra resources for important programmes because we're changing government to make sure it meets the needs of people today, not of 20, 30 or 40 years ago. We're cutting government bureaucracy, <laughs> cracking down on fraud, getting government out of activities it need not be involved in and using private sector skills and finance to provide better public services. And that is the hallmark of a government that's looking to the future needs of a modern industrial state. We're now making spectacular efficiency gains as a result of our civil service reforms of recent years. In my last budget, I remind the House that I cut provision for central government running costs by 10% in real terms over three years. This year, I will go much further on top of that. The cash cost of Whitehall will be £860 million lower in three years' time than it is today. In real terms, this represents total savings of 12%, which is equivalent to a saving of nearly £2 billion a year. But we must never delude ourselves that more resources for schools, hospitals and police, as well as tax cuts, can be paid for just by eliminating waste in the public sector. Life isn't that simple. We've also had to look elsewhere. Three years ago, before my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Social Security, very skillfully, in my opinion, put in place a programme for long-term reform, we were expecting Social Security spending to grow by over 3% each year in real terms. We now expect real growth in planned spending of around 1% per year over the next three years. This reduction in growth will build up year on year to a cash saving of huge proportions. The changes we've made and which we're making are an assurance for future generations. We're going to leave our children a welfare state that works and a welfare system which they can afford. Yeah. Now, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Social Security, will announce the details of this year's settlement to the House tomorrow. I, I will just set out the main points. Increases in Social Security spending next year will be well within the growth of the economy. We will ensure that all that spending represents legitimate spending on people in genuine need. That's why my right honourable friend will give details of a further intensive campaign against fraud. He will also announce measures which will mean people who apply for asylum on arrival in the country will cease to receive benefits after an unfavourable adjudication. My my right honourable friend will announce steps to close the gap between single parents' benefit and those paid to other families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the right approach to single parents is neither to penalise them nor to favour them. The costs and responsibilities of having children are the same for couples as they are for single people. We intend to build at the same time on our previous measures to help more mothers move from benefit dependency into work. My right honourable friend will announce a package of measures to encourage work, including a further increase in the childcare allowance in family credit from £40 to £60 each week. Next, housing benefit. The housing benefit system should not be an inducement for young people to leave their families before they need to. My right honourable friend will announce measures to restrict the amount of housing benefit paid to single people under the age of 25 to a maximum that more sensibly reflects their circumstances. Well, the benefit system should offer a real incentive to young people to rent within their means, improving their incentives to work rather than dependency on the social security system. And the other side of the house are so predictable. It, it's by restricting spending in these areas that we can protect people in greatest need and stand by our pledges on pensions and child benefit. Others apparently claim to be thinking the unthinkable. I yet to see evidence that they're thinking at all. <laughs> this government has acted decisively to put in place policies to bring social security spending under better control. Let no one underestimate what we've achieved. The measures that I've now announced in my three budgets will reduce planned social security expenditure by five billion pounds each year by the end of the century. Now, social security is a good example of how more money can be found to be spent on areas we care most about by trimming back elsewhere. We've actually applied this principle to most other programmes. When honourable members examine the full details of our spending plans, they'll find that in practically every department of government, we found some significant savings while protecting the front line of public service delivery. Let me give two examples. Uh, we found further efficiency savings in defence, that we maintain fully our commitment to a strong front line. And in a tight public spending round in the Foreign Office, the planned allocation for bilateral aid is likely to be little changed from that set out in last year's departmental report. British bilateral aid is internationally recognised for its high quality and for the substantial share going to the poorest countries in Africa and Asia, and this will continue. But we're also doing more to get the government out of activities it simply need not be involved in. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Defence, is today announcing his intention to transfer ownership of the Ministry of Defence married quarters estate to the private sector. This will, this will actually improve the management of the estate, which will be good for the services and good for service families. We plan to privatise the Housing Corporation loan book and to encourage the banks to provide student loans. There are many services. There are many services that the government has a duty to ensure are provided as public services, but where private sector management skills and expertise can improve delivery to the public. This is where the private finance initiative actually comes in. Under the private finance initiative, the public sector doesn't simply sign a contract to buy a prison, a train or a computer system. It pays to have specific services supplied at guaranteed levels of performance, available prison places, trains running reliably on the Northern Line, national insurance records kept up to date. Our well, party obviously better make their mind up whether they agree with this as policy or not. It rather depends which uh, day of the week it is or which spokesman is speaking, as far as I've been able to uh, see. What this government does, developing the policy, is to choose the quality services the public require and then goes out and acquires those services from private companies with the finance and expertise to deliver. The key point is the initiative delivers infrastructure projects of higher quality at a lower overall cost to the British taxpayer. That's because the private sector puts its own money at risk and brings its own management skills to bear. 
The initiative means that better public services will be provided by better private means. The service remains a public service and the taxpayers get a better deal, which is no wonder why some of our critics have decided to copy our innovative policy. Now we are, as the deputy leader demands, far beyond the stage of simply identifying projects. The money is starting to flow. We expect actual capital spending under the private finance initiative to be around £2 billion per year and rising over the next three years. We expect to have agreed contracts worth at least £14 billion by the end of 1998-99. to now, This money is replacing old-style public sector capital spending and it can deliver big gains in value for money for the taxpayer. In the past, cost overruns and delays were typical of public sector capital projects. The private finance initiative is delivering better quality projects. Take two well-known examples. For example, the PFI contract for Northern Line trains specifies reliability levels which are nearly four times above the best fleet currently operating on London Underground. The service we'll get from the new national insurance record system could have cost up to twice what we will in the event pay under the privately financed deal that we struck. As a result of these flows of private finance, we've been able to find savings in publicly financed capital while maintaining overall high levels of investment activity and high quality investment. Let me just illustrate progress with another four projects that demonstrate the extent to which the private finance initiative is spreading to all parts of government activity. First, Mr Chairman, I can announce a huge new package of privately financed roads, five new projects with a capital value totaling £500 million. Secondly, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, has announced today that a £35 million deal is going ahead to modernise two hospitals for the South Buckinghamshire NHS Trust. Third, we're tendering for the refurbishment of Loudham Grange Prison, a £50 million project to add to the two new prison building contracts at Bridgend and Fazakerley, which will be signed shortly. Finally, full bed bids will be due on the 5th of December for the £45 million water project in Inverness and Fort William. My honourable friend, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, will be publishing more details tomorrow on the progress, the real progress, of the private finance initiative. In the 1980s, our privatisation programme brought enormous benefits to the British economy. Our private finance initiative can and will do the same in the 1990s and beyond. We're also rapidly developing our innovative idea of challenge funding. Challenge funding invites groups to compete for public funds to improve local services. Hey, this is another way in which the quality and value for money of public services is improved. The uh, first single regeneration budget challenge fund bidding round ensured that every one pound of public money, attra public money attracted another pound of private funding. £250 million pounds have been made available for the third and fourth bidding rounds for the Single Regeneration Budget Challenge Fund. This will help regenerate many areas, including inner city areas. And over £300 million pounds of challenge funding will be made available to speed up the transfer of deprived housing estates to housing associations and other private landlords. Challenge funding has enormous potential for projects of all kinds. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for the Environment, is considering more challenge funding for a wider range of local authority capital provision, and he will be making an announcement in this debate later this week. Challenge funding ensures the best possible projects get the money while fostering genuine local commitment to the project. So public spending as a share of national income varies from year to year. But under this government's policies, and I've described their policies, their policies of change and of priorities, over the past 16 years, the trend has been downward. In the mid-1970s, when public spending peaked, it peaked at 47.25% of national income. The next peak reached 45.5% in the early 1980s, and the last peak was 43.5% in the recession of the early 1990s. I now expect total public spending to be 42% of national income this year. 
When I became Chancellor two and a half years ago, I said we should aim to push the ratio below 40% and keep it there. The decisions I'm announcing today will achieve that aim. The ratio will be below 40% from 1997 to 1998 onwards. That's far below the ratio in any other major European country. Controlling public spending is crucial to our goal of making the economy more successful and making it the enterprise centre of Europe. I have now taken £53 billion out of projected public spending in my three budgets. I judge this necessary to reduce government borrowing following the international recession of the 1990s. Now, even with the extra money for schools, the extra money for hospitals, and the extra money for the police, I now expect total planned public spending to be kept broadly unchanged in real terms over the next three years. When we first set out our public spending control totals three years ago, most of the pundits didn't believe we could stick to them. The doubters have been proved wrong. Not only have we stuck to our plans, I've managed to reduce them again for the third year running. So next year, the control total will be three and a quarter billion pounds below the level that I set in last year's budget. That's 12 billion pounds below the level we expected it would be for that year when I was first appointed Chancellor. Now, having carefully reviewed the latest projections for public borrowing in the light of those decisions, I have concluded that we can now return to the task of starting to cut taxes again. Well, I hope some members offered it do begin to understand there is a correlation between the two in a well-managed economy. <laughs> I am able to make tax cuts broadly equivalent to the spending reductions, with government borrowing still falling to zero by the end of the decade. After the budget measures are taken into account, I expect the PSBR to continue to fall at roughly the rate we've now achieved in the last two years. I expect the PSBR to fall from £29 billion this year to £22.5 billion in 1996 to 97 and £15 billion in 1997 to 98. Broad balance should be reached after a further two years. The financial deficit is now expected to be close to the Maastricht reference level of 3% of GDP in 1996 to 97 and to fall well below it in subsequent years. So fiscal policy will remain tight. That's why the measures in this year's budget are economically and socially responsible. And I've made clear all along that every budget I deliver will be dominated by the long-term interests of the British economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me now turn to my tax proposals. <laughs> I've had to consider carefully where tax cuts might fall. Since 1979, this government has shifted the tax burden away from direct taxes which fall on income and employment and towards indirect taxes on spending and consumption. Oh, yeah, that's the best way to encourage enterprise and investment and it's the best way to improve the long-term performance of the British economy. But before moving on to direct tax, let me run through my proposals for indirect taxes. Last year, I proposed a new landfill tax, which is a charge on the disposal of waste in, for example, tips and uh, old quarries. This will come into effect on the 1st of October, 1996. It will be charged at the standard rate of £7 a tonne and a lower rate of £2 for inactive waste. Now, this is a tax on waste in order to enable me to reduce the tax on jobs. The money raised by the landfill tax will allow for a matching cut in the main rate of employers' national insurance contributions by a further 0.2% to 10% from April 1997. This will cut the cost of employment by half a billion and will make it cheaper for businesses to create new jobs. Yeah. Next, I intend to stick to my commitment to raise road fuel duties by at least 5% on average in real terms. From 6pm this evening 
tax on petrol and diesel will rise by three, three and a half pence a litre. I also plan to increase the tax on super unleaded petrol by a further fourpence next May. This reflects its higher emission of pollutants such as benzene and the dangers to the revenue of switching to super unleaded from leaded petrol. Despite these increases, petrol prices in this country should remain lower than in any other major European country. L last year, I froze the duty on gas used in road vehicles. That's uh, liquid petroleum gas and compressed natural gas, pending further work on their impact on the environment. Studies since then have confirmed that these are relatively clean fuels. The government would like to help encourage further use of these fuels and I propose to reduce the duty on them by 15%. We expect emissions of most pollutants from vehicles to fall over the next few years, but emissions of some pollutants may remain at high levels. So the government now intends to look into ways of using vehicle excise duty to encourage low emission vehicles. That somebody welcomes it. This year, the, uh, <laughs> this year the tax dish for cars will rise by five pounds but I'm freezing the rates for lorries for the sixth consecutive year. Honest motorists are irritated by tax disc evaders. The Secretary of State for Transport and I are publishing today a revised proposal on continuous licensing, which will make it easier to enforce the collection of vehicle excise duty. But we won't be requiring licenses for vehicles when they're kept off the road. To make sure that the new system doesn't penalise vintage and classic car enthusiasts, many of whom only run their cars on the road occasionally, we will be exempting from duty all cars and motorcycles over 25 years old, taking 150,000 historic vehicles out of tax. Well, my PPS is not the only member who approves of that. The, the, the National Lottery has been an outstanding success. And over a billion pounds has been raised for good causes over the past year. But its success has affected other parts of the gambling industry in Britain. I, I'm satisfied that the industry's concerns are genuine. And I propose to cut general betting duty by 1%. The benefits should be spread between the betting industry and horse and greyhound racing. If satisfactory agreement can be reached quickly, the duty cut can take effect from the 1st of March. The pools companies have also been affected by the success of the National Lottery. I propose to reduce pool betting duty by a further 5% from the 3rd of December on top of a similar cut that I made last year. Chairman, I'm willing to reduce pool betting duty by another 1% from the 5th of May if the pools companies will agree to pass on that extra 1% equally to the Football Trust and the Foundation for Sport and the Arts. Yeah. This reduction would help the Trust and the Foundation to continue their valuable work, and I'm sure we welcome as it has been on all sides of the House. In my 1993 budget, I gave a commitment to raise duty on tobacco by at least 3% a year uh, in real terms in future budgets. Uh, I thought then that was the most fair and effective way of backing up health warnings on smoking, and I remain convinced of that today. From 6 p.m. this evening, the tax on a packet of 20 cigarettes will increase by 15 pence, on a packet of small cigars by about 6 pence, and on a 25 gram packet of pipe tobacco by about 8 pence. I intend, to freeze du I intend to freeze duty on hand-rolling tobacco this year because it's proving to be far the easiest product to smuggle. Next, alcohol. <laughs> Cross-border shopping and the smuggling of alcohol is a serious problem for the retail drinks industry in Britain. And it affects government revenue, although our total revenue is actually still rising. Shopping abroad is one of the greater freedoms gained for consumers in the European single market. Uh, but smuggling is a crime which we will continue to fight. Our duty levels are higher than those of our continental neighbours. Each member state must retain its freedom to set its own tax levels. And uh, we accept the downward competitive pressures on tax in a single market. We therefore have to address the legitimate concerns of the British drinks industry, but at the same time minimise losses of revenue 
that would otherwise have to be raised by other taxes. This year, I propose to freeze the duty on beer and wine. Tax as a share of the cost of a pint of beer will now be the lowest that it's been in this country for over 20 years. There are two changes I propose to make to other duty rates here at home. Very strong cider is presently under tax compared with other drinks, and I intend to raise its duty by eight pence a pint from next October without disturbing the rate for ordinary ciders. High rates of duty at home have made it difficult for the Scotch whisky industry to press their excellent case for lower duty rates in other countries. Scotch is one of our most important exports from the United Kingdom. Spirits duty will therefore be reduced by 4% from 6 o'clock today. That's equivalent to 27 pence off a bottle of whisky. The last of the more expensive stuff. <laughs> I, I, I turn now to the utilities. Uh, my right honourable friend, the President of the Board of Trade, will speak about the regulatory regi regime that protects consumer interests in his speech in the budget debate on Thursday. Uh, I have been looking at the case for a windfall tax on the utilities. I, I've been told that it, it has many splendid qualities. It's a one-off tax. It's often described as if it hurts nobody. It's claimed it has no impact on the economy and apparently it can be used to pay for up to 10 public spending proposals which cost <laughs> far in excess of the amount of tax it actually raises. <laughs> what, what, a, what a potential pot of gold. They say it's an elixir to cure all some people's ills. Uh, of course, it's, it's nothing of the kind, Mr Chairman. A windfall tax would damage investments and it would threaten the quality of customer service. It is an illusion that a windfall tax is paid by the company. It's paid by its shareholders, including many small shareholders and pension funds. And it would mean higher future prices for customers. The whole point of privatisation is to benefit consumers, not simply the exchequer. I have no intention of introducing such a tax. Yeah. <laughs> well, and if that's meant to be a help to the Labour Party, heaven help them. I, sort of, I don't think they'll make much with that. <laughs> Let me turn some other proposals I do not intend to make. I, I have no plans, and I never did have any plans, to change the rules which allow the first £30,000 of redundancy payments to be received free of tax. I also never contemplated any increase in insurance premium tax, nor air passenger duty. Those ideas were inventions of the newspapers that wrote about them. Tax law has become too long and complicated. And that campaign is certainly well founded, and some experts have described the tax law as incomprehensible. The Inland Revenue will shortly be publishing a report on tax simplification. We will propose that the revenue co tax code is rewritten in plain English, a major task. <laughs> well, this House has a duty to set out clear legislation, which we haven't done in this area. So we in the House will need to look at our procedures to see how this tax rewrite can be sensibly handled. The government's commitment to home ownership remains as strong as ever. Today, there are 16 million homes in the United Kingdom occupied by their owners, uh, that's 40% more than when we came to power in 1979. All surveys show that the vast majority of British people still want to own their own homes. Uh, we therefore set out a target in our housing white paper of a further 1.5 million homeowners over the next 10 years. I reaffirm that mortgage interest relief will remain unchanged for the lifetime of this Parliament. We've already introduced measures for mortgage lenders to make it easier for people with negative equity to move home. And the Finance Bill will pave the way for housing investment trusts which will encourage investment in private rented housing. I have considered very carefully the case urged upon me for special measures to revive the housing market. Many housing experts, sadly and reluctantly, are forced to the same conclusion as me that none of the affordable proposals would actually make any difference. The problem at the moment is not the cost to the purchaser of house purchase. 
there have never been such bargains on the market. An average mortgage costs only around £180 per month, which is far less than renting an equivalent property. And houses are more affordable than they've been for years. I remain convinced that what the housing market needs above all is steady growth in the economy and low inflation. That's what this budget delivers. This budget will reinforce my ability to keep interest rates and mortgage costs down. And that matters most of all to the housing market. All the major lenders expect prices to start to rise next year, and as confidence grows, I expect the market to start to move soon. Now I now turn to my proposals for direct taxation. I want to do four things this year. I want to give people more security by ensuring that their needs will be met in old age. I want to help people have a greater personal share in the prosperity and success of the businesses for which they work. I want to encourage enterprise, particularly small businesses. And I want to allow people to keep more of the money that they earn and which they save to spend as they choose, not as the state chooses. That's essential in a modern, dynamic economy. In this budget, I'll be helping people who are earning and helping people who are saving. But I also want to help those people who've worked and saved for all their lives. Some of these people may be unfortunate enough to need care in residential or nursing homes in their old age. If they do, they may find their savings eaten away quickly to pay for that care. Of course, this is one of the rainy days for which people save in the first place. But the balance between the state paying and the family paying must be right. If it's not, many prudent people will complain that they're being treated unfairly compared with those who were unable or unwilling to save at all. To help people who've already put money aside, it was recently decided to exempt from VAT some forms of care provided in someone's own home. I now have two important further proposals. First, I intend to exempt from tax the benefits from a range of insurance policies which provide long-term care benefits. We should encourage, not penalise, people who decide to take more responsibility for themselves. Second, at present, only people with assets worth less than £3,000 are not asked to make any contribution from their capital towards the costs of residential or nursing home care. People with assets worth more than £8,000 receive no financial support from the government. And when applied to care in residential and nursing homes, these limits are far too low. From April, and sooner if practicable, we will more than treble the lower threshold from £3,000 to £10,000. And we will double the upper threshold from £8,000 to £16,000. And that means, Mr Chairman, that people in residential care who've worked hard and saved will now keep more of their own money. This will give many elderly people and their families more financial security and greater peace of mind. But we also want to find more ways of helping people who are now in work or recently retired and want to plan ahead to prepare for their old age. We will be consulting shortly on an innovative range of proposals to encourage people to make provision for long-term care. We're studying in particular the concept of so-called partnership schemes. The essence of these will be that individuals who plan ahead to meet a proportion of long-term care costs themselves will be able to retain more of their assets above the £16,000 capital threshold. State-funded care will, of course, still be there for all those who need it. But those who provided for themselves will be able to keep more of their own savings. The partnership approach combines state provision for the needy with reward for the thrifty who make provision for themselves. In addition, I've asked the Inland Revenue to consult on the possibility of extending to members of occupational pension schemes the option to take a variable pension. This could provide a larger pension in later years when people are more likely to need long-term care in exchange for a smaller pension earlier on. For future generations, long-term care will be a growing problem for the finances of many families in this country. The government's put in a lot of work to put together a package to meet their concerns. We will now go out and consult 
and explain our ideas in detail. For all retired people living on their savings, the pensioner bonds that I introduced have proved a very popular national savings product. The House will recall I introduced them two years ago. I'm today announcing that we're reducing the qualifying age for purchases of these bonds from 65 to 60. And taken together, this package of measures covering these big problems of savings and long-term care for the elderly are the mark of a government that cares about our elderly, their families, and their sense of security. It also shows, yet again, that we're a government that looks to the long term in all these difficult areas of social policy. Now, I'm proud of our record of wider share ownership, which has seen the number of shareholders in this country treble. There are now 10 million shareholders in Britain. Thanks to the policies of this government, shareholding is no longer a minority interest. All of the old-fashioned distinctions between employee and employer, between capital and labour, are being broken down in our modern enterprise economy. Most employees understand that their rewards depend on the success of the businesses for which they work. Most businesses believe that the best way to motivate staff is to let them share in the rewards of success. The public's willingness to embrace and understand these principles has been a major culture change over the last 16 years. Now, an important part of this change has been the spread of employee share ownership, which is one of the most attractive features of what's become known as popular capitalism. Holding shares in the company for which they work gives people a stake in the company's future success. And actually, nobody in this House has advocated the cause of performance-related rewards and employee share ownership, more than I have over the years, and I started doing so well before these ideas became fashionable. We have two tax privilege schemes to encourage share ownership for all employees. Save as you earn schemes, which encourage share ownership through share options linked to savings plans, and profit sharing schemes, which allow employees to receive free shares. There are around one million people in each scheme. I want to build on these successes by improving both schemes. The minimum period for saving under an SAYE scheme will be reduced from five years to three, and the minimum contribution will be halved to five pounds a month. The holding period under profit sharing schemes will also be reduced from five to three years. These changes will increase significantly the attractiveness of these employee share owning schemes, but I'm going to do more. In July, the House will recall, I withdrew the tax privileges attaching to some so-called executive share options. The overwhelming majority of companies use these options for their more senior employees. I actually always approved of such options so long as they were linked to genuine performance, but I didn't see any justification for maintaining their tax privileges. The resulting debate brought out that there was a demand for a third type of wider share ownership scheme to provide a more flexible basis of granting options to lower paid employees. I'm therefore introducing a new tax relief which will enable companies to grant options under a scheme approved by the Inland Revenue up to a limit of £20,000. The conditions for the new relief will be similar to the conditions which applied to the old one. And the relief will also be available to schemes in existence at the 17th of July 1995 which qualified under the old rules subject to the £20,000 limit. These changes go further than ever before in creating a climate in which employee share ownership can become the norm. And I hope that companies will offer all their employees, not just their executives, the chance to enjoy the economic benefits and the sense of ownership that shareholding can bring. Now, I've said several times in this speech that the government's aim is to turn Britain into the enterprise centre of Europe. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we're going. We're encouraging more innovation, investment and growth. And that means allowing people to keep more of the income that they earn, and I shall have more to say about that in a moment. It also means encouraging people to save more, to invest more, and to build up uh, more personal wealth. It also means helping small businesses. The backbone of our modern, dynamic, successful economy is an active small business sector. Small businesses are the seed corn of our future prosperity. So I have some important measures this year to help businesses and small businesses in particular. Firstly, help with business rates. Many businesses faced uh, lower rate bills 
following the five yearly revaluation of rateable values. But many other businesses faced higher bills. And to help that group, I announced in last year's budget that real terms increases in rate bills will be capped to a maximum of 10% a year. Uh, I've looked at this cap again, and I no longer consider it to be low enough. For 1996 to 97, the maximum real terms increase in rates bills for all businesses will be reduced from 10% to 7.5%. Small businesses will get extra help. The maximum increase for small properties will be 5% instead of 7.5%. 1,200,000 business properties will benefit from these changes, including 870,000 small properties. Investment is important for prosperity, and investment depends on capital. We want to reduce taxes on capital to encourage and reward the investment that the millions of people who work for private businesses depend upon. We remain committed to abolishing capital gains tax when resources allow. The starting point must be helped for those who built up their own businesses. I want to be sure that they can sell up and enjoy the rewards of their own hard work in managing the business that they owned. Tax relief for the owners of businesses selling up on retirement was substantially increased in 1991 and again in 1993, so that capital gains of up to a million pounds now benefit from this relief. This year I'm going to extend further the relief for owners who worked hard and created their own businesses by reducing the qualifying age from 55 to 50. This will reward the success of more of those people who own and manage their own business. It will increase incentives for those who are going to work in their own business in the future. It's the mark of a government that backs enterprise. Well, if I repeat the word often enough, the party opposite might eventually at least discover how to spell it. At the moment, they're not up to speed on it in any other way. But it's not just businesses that create wealth. Thanks to this government's policies, ordinary, hard-working people have a bigger personal stake in the wealth of this country than ever before. In our property-owning democracy, more and more people have the opportunity to own their own homes, have occupational or personal pensions, invest in tesses and pets, build up other savings and own shares. And these benefits are now being enjoyed by the many and not just the few. Many people who don't consider themselves rich work hard and save for their families throughout their whole lives. They pay their taxes when they work. They want to pass on their family capital without having it taxed again when they die. Many people want to pass on an inheritance to their children and their grandchildren to give them a better start in life than they had. It's a natural instinct in families. Inheritance is now an issue for Middle Britain, and it's to help Middle Britain that we aim to abolish inheritance tax as soon as we can afford to do so. It's a myth that inheritance tax is paid only by the very rich. In fact, the very rich are well placed to dispose of their wealth in their own lifetime. Most people hit by inheritance tax are those who wouldn't consider themselves rich at all. These are people who will bequeath not much more than the present tax-free allowance of £154,000. They may be people who own their home and a few modest investments. There are many more people like them who fear their assets will be hit by inheritance tax. I therefore propose to increase the tax-free allowance substantially to £200,000. The number paying inheritance tax will be reduced by one-third and only one in 45 estates will now pay this tax in future. Inheritance tax can also have a direct effect on enterprise. A family company, for example, may have to be broken up when the owner dies. We already recognize this problem through the existence of business property relief for qualifying unquoted companies. I now propose to remove the problem altogether by extending 100% relief to unquoted shareholdings, whatever their size. Finally, I turn to my proposals for income tax payers. In the post-war era, when Britain went into comparative economic decline, Britain had high rates of taxation on income. Those rates damaged the economy and stifled prosperity. We had a tax policy that was based on envy. When this government came to power, the basic rate was 33%. The top rate on earnings was 83%. Rates on so-called unearned income were as high as 98%. 
There was nothing fair about taxation before we started to make it fairer. Yeah. During the past 16 years, we've cut the basic rate by around one quarter to 25%, and we've abolished all rates of income tax above 40%. But the income tax burden is about more than just tax rates. Tax allowances matter as well. I propose to increase allowances for married couples and people receiving related allowances by 70 pounds in line with indexation. Uh, it's a myth that the tax system penalizes marriage and that single people are better off than uh, married couples within the British taxation system. Uh, any young couple contemplating living together and starting a family will pay less tax by getting married. As the economy continues to grow and create jobs, more people, as they return to work, will find themselves earning more than the tax threshold. I believe that we should relieve as many of the lower paid as possible from the burden of income tax. I therefore propose to increase the basic personal allowance by 240 pounds, and that's 100 pounds more than indexation. This will provide an incentive to work to those at the bottom of the income scale. More than 200,000 people will be kept out of tax compared with the indexation of allowances. People who don't consider themselves rich now find that their incomes may bring them into the top rate of tax. That has a lot to do with the growth of the economy over 16 years and a lot to do with the growth in personal incomes. I don't want more people to be taken into the 40% band this year. I therefore propose to raise the higher rate threshold by £1,200. That's £200 more than indexation. But in the longer term, of course, we have a clear and achievable goal for income tax, moving to a basic rate of 20% as soon as we can. This year, I can move much faster towards that goal. I propose to increase the 20% band by a further £700. That's £500 more than indexation. And that will bring an extra 1 million people into that band. That means that around a quarter of all taxpayers, that's over 6 million people, will pay tax on their income at just 20%. There were many who doubted the credibility of our goal of a 20p basic rate when we first set it out in 1992. We're now making big strides towards achieving it. Some people are even having to resort to trying to outbid us, I've discovered in recent debates. <laughs> but widening the lower rate band isn't the only route to 20 pence. I want to make progress on another front. I therefore also propose to reduce the rate of tax on all savings income for all basic rate taxpayers to just 20%. This will apply to the tax deducted from interest on bank and building society accounts, for example. And it's an equivalent to an increase in interest rates for savings income. Around 14 million savers will gain from this tax reduction, and they will see the income from their savings increase. As a result of this measure, people will gain an extra five pounds from every hundred pounds they receive an interest from their building society account. Many of those who benefit will be pensioners. Pensioners on average will gain 75 pounds a year. Some could, could stand to gain 500 pounds a year more. So again, those who have earned and saved will be able to keep more of their own money and benefit more from their own money. And this measure is another and decisive step to a 20% basic rate for all income. I propose to reduce the small companies' rate of corporation tax to 24%, Mr Chairman. The reason I'm able to reduce the small companies' rate of corporation tax is that the small companies' rate has been, for many years, been pegged to the basic rate of income tax. My final proposal in this budget is therefore to reduce the basic rate of income tax by one penny to 24 pence in the pound.
It's no good laughing. That was the, that was the small, shortest smile on the face of the member of Dunfer for Dunfermline that I'd seen even from him in a very long time. Because these three steps, widening the 20 pence band, a 20 pence tax rate for savings income, and a penny off the basic rate, move us much closer to a 20% basic rate of tax for all income. We have a clear order. commitment. Order. To order. 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 The House should listen to the Chancellor. Chancellor yeah. Exchequer. We have a clear commitment to the 20 pence basic rate. We believe in it and we can achieve it. As a result of the measures in this budget, a married couple with only one earner, on average earnings with two children, will pay £190 less tax. But overall, their real take-home pay after tax will rise by around £450 next year. They will be £700 a year better off than they were at the time of the last election. And that's extra money for families to spend as they wish. My budgets for the last two years have kept us on the course we said we would follow. We've cut taxes, we're cutting taxes, and when we can afford it, and when it's in the interest of the economy, we will cut taxes again. Good economics is good politics. This budget puts Britain on course to be the enterprise centre of Europe, a Britain that creates more jobs and more wealth in which all can share, because business can flourish here in a secure climate of low borrowing, low taxation, deregulation and free trade. That's why this budget controls overall public spending while shifting more money towards schools, towards hospitals and towards the police. That's why this budget keeps government borrowing on a downward path. And that's why this budget cuts taxes. And I've only achieved that hat-trick, controlling spending, downward borrowing, cutting taxes, because the government has followed a consistent economic policy. Only we in this House have clear objectives and we know how to achieve them. We're aiming at borrowing falling to zero, public spending below 40% of national income, inflation below 2.5% and a 20% basic rate of income tax. This budget puts us on a path to meet all those goals and I commend Mr. Chairman, this budget to the House. And so the Chancellor sits down after one hour and eight minutes or so of that speech. We'll go back in a moment to hear Tony Blair's first reaction. Let's just see quickly the main measures that were announced. The basic rate of income tax is cut by one penny from 25 to 24 pence. The personal allowance goes up above inflation by 100 pounds by 240 pounds. Married couples allowance up by 70 pounds, you get 15% of that. And the 20 pence band is widened by 700 pounds of taxable income. In addition to that, cigarettes go up by 15 pence a pack, but whiskey goes down 27 pence a bottle. No change on wine and no change on beer. Leaded petrol up 3.5 per litre and car road tax up five pounds, but various changes which we'll go into later. Let's just have a quick look, Peter, at how it will affect people. Right, just very quickly the look, first of all, then at income tax, the direct tax change in this budget. This is only the effect on your income tax weekly change or weekly tax cut. There's a £5,000 income at the bottom there, just 71 pence a week. In, 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 our allowances are indexed up. As you go up the scale, so you get better off, there's average earnings, £4 a week better off there. £10.34 from a £30,000 uh, a year income. £10 is something like £500 a year better off then, £50,000 and £100,000 better off by £10 a week. So it's from 71 pence a week down here at the bottom of the scale up to £10 a week uh, if you're on the higher rate tax up there. So in the House of Commons, they're just putting a formal notice on some of the duty changes that take place at six o'clock tonight. And we now will hear from Tony Blair. Let's go back to the House. And it is Unless you join us, David, the, uh, the Chairman of Ways and Means, Michael Morris, is just finishing the formalities. Today and the succeeding days. There'll be a the budget debate for several days hereafter. We've just been going through the, the formal the motions required to put into effect those immediate tax changes on, it, on uh, fuel, petrol, and so forth. In a few moments, the Leader of the Opposition, Tony Blair, who's uh, going through his notes and having a quick final conflab with the Shadow Chancellor, Gordon Brown, he'll give his immediate response. 
not an easy matter for the Leader of the Opposition to have to reply immediately to a budget statement which he won't have seen. And then Gordon Brown, the Shadow Chancellor, will get a chance for a more considered reply tomorrow. Just the end of the formalities. On the printed resolution, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Tony Blair. Mr Deputy Speaker, sir. I suspect what we have just seen is probably the shortest lasting cheer on the Conservative benches in all the budgets we have witnessed. If this, if this, budget, if this budget was supposed to relaunch the Conservative Party, it will fail. This budget will be known as the 7p up, 1p down budget. And Mr Deputy Speaker, the people of Britain, after all, are not novices dealing with the Tories. They are battle-hardened today. Their innocence has given way to experience their faith to mistrust. They have learnt two hard lessons from these masters of political deception. Two hard lessons. First, over 16 years, they know above all else that what they are given with one hand is taken away with the other. One hand may hold open the public purse, the other is usually in the citizen's pocket. Income taxes, they say, have been cut over the years. But then has come the other taxes, the charges, the costs, the fees. Dentists, prescriptions, rail fares, bus, tube fares, school books, repairs to school buildings, rent rises, water bills, insurance premiums. They don't like being reminded of it, but that is Conservative government. The second lesson. The second lesson is this, that in the end, what matters is the real strength of the economy. That behind the year-to-year -year decisions on tax, especially those made before an election, stand the big questions that dwarf the rest into insignificance. And people have learned something about that too after 16 years. They know that for 16 years, we have had Conservative chancellors standing there, telling us we were about to have an economic miracle, telling us that we were about to overtake all the other nations of the world, telling us that this time it would be different, to trust them again. They know, too, that after 16 years, their living standards have fallen, compared with other countries, from 13th down to 18th in the National Prosperity League. They know that despite the tax changes, these Tories that call themselves the tax cutters take a higher proportion of national income in tax today from ordinary families than they did 16 years ago. And they know, they know that during those 16 years, these people had the benefit, as no other government had, as no other government had, £120 billion worth of North Sea oil, gone. £80 billion pounds worth of the nation's assets sold and gone, the money spent. And they know that whatever promises were made before the last election, and those promises are identical to the ones made today, they know that we ended up with the largest peacetime tax rise in British history to cover the largest borrowing ever in British history. And they know that today, even with this tax cut, the public sector borrowing requirement is going to be £29 billion, pounds, £6 billion up on what they forecast last year. And is it not right that for next year it's going to be £22.5 billion, pounds, £10 billion up on what they forecast last year? Now, of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are certain things that we will welcome. The long-term care, though I have to say on long-term care, we will study carefully the details, but I suspect that there will be a large number of families that are left out of this altogether. But anyway, we will return to that in the debate. The landfill green tax, of course... The so Tony Blair, the leader of the Labour Party, of the opposition in the House of Commons, 
and uh, making his first reaction. It is very much a first reaction. The Shadow Chancellor, uh, Gordon Brown, will speak tomorrow in some detail. As you see, he says, we'll look very carefully at the measures which indeed he's only just heard. We'll be watching the rest of that speech, and later on in this program, we will turn around what he said and give you the highlights of it so that you don't miss anything. But our main job this afternoon is to try and explain as clearly as we can what it is that the Chancellor has done in his budget statement that ran for an hour, 10 minutes or so, which included fairly complicated alterations to income tax and duties and all the rest of it, and also a large number of other changes affecting particularly elderly people, people in care, and all that sort of thing. So let us just have a look carefully at what it was that the Chancellor announced. First of all, at the very end of his speech, almost the last sentence, he came to income tax and said that he was cutting the basic rate by one penny to 24 pence. The married couple's allowance would go up by 70 pounds. You only get 15% in reality of that, if that's the, speaking the way that he normally does. The personal allowance would go up by 240 pounds before you have to start paying tax. The 20 pence, the lower band, is widened by 700 pounds. And we'll show you how this affects various incomes in a moment with Peter Snow. Furthermore, the higher rate threshold before you start paying the top rate of tax at 40% would go up by 1,200 pounds and there'd be a special reduction in the tax on income from savings. It would go down to 20% for basic rate taxpayers. Duties. Interestingly, on beer and wine, he said there'd be no change at all and spirits would go down 4%. But extra strong cider, he didn't say exactly what extra strong cider was, he didn't define it, but extra strong cider, which apparently is undertaxed, will go up by eight pence a pint, but not straight away, not until next October. Cigarettes in the nanny state has long been a bugbear of chancellors and once again he's putting it up by 15 pence for a packet of cigarettes and similar increases. Packs of cigars go up by sixpence and uh, loose tobacco for pipe smoking also goes up. They're not apparently loose tobacco for rolling cigarettes because that's easily smuggled so they don't want to make it uh, too easy for people to sell the smuggled variety. Then he turned to petrol. All forms of petrol go up by three and a half pence per litre immediately, and diesel as well, but interestingly super unleaded, which, as you'll know if you follow these things, is now thought to be more dangerous than uh, even ordinary petrol, is going to have a further fourpence a litre put on it, but not until next May. On transport duties, road tax, the disc on the car goes up by five pounds to 140 pounds, the lorry rate is frozen, cars and motorcycles over 25 years old are exempt, an old banger's charter from the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And then on long-term care, there's a lot of worry, and he went on at some time about this, about the huge cost of elderly people, an increasing proportion of society, going into long-term care, and he announced various measures to try and help them. Insurance policies, that's the premiums paid on insurance policies specifically designed for care, and presumably the receipts from them are going to be exempt from tax. And the amount of uh, money that you can hold as an elderly person before you have to, uh, before your, the state demands money from you, is going to be increased from 3,000 to 10,000. And the figure we have there of 16,000 is the point at which you won't be entitled to support. Those limits have been doubled. It was 3,000 pounds that you didn't have to declare you could keep before you had to start paying and it was £8,000 after which you received no support. That's now been doubled to £16,000. And then further moves on savings. The age limit for pensioners' bonds reduced from 65 to 60, and a new tax relief for share options up to £20,000, a top limit. Capital taxes, he said it was his, still his determination to abolish inheritance tax until they could afford that for the moment they were going to increase the threshold at which it would become due and he said this wasn't a rich man's tax but a tax on people of modest means on the whole who had a house and a little bit of savings you won't pay inheritance tax now until you have two hundred thousand pounds of money uh, in to, to be inherited and the relief on capital gains tax also extended on uh, business rates these are the rates that are now uh, fixed separately from independent councils. They're fixed nationwide, and he was worried they were going up too steeply. They're gradually moving up until they reach the, the full rate that they're going to be at. So he's going to stop them going up for all companies at more than 7.5%, and for small businesses at more than 5%. Uh, he went on to, or he began by talking, I should say, about the government borrowing, the thing that's at the back of all this, and announced quite hefty increases in public sector borrowing 
the forecast for 95.6 at 29 billion and then 96.97 at 22 billion, substantially up on what he announced last year and 97.8 at 15 billion, it was going to be 5 billion, so fairly hefty increases in public borrowing. But he said nevertheless that he intended to get the whole thing into balance within uh, two years after that, so within, by, by the turn of the century in effect. Uh, they, they should reach broad balance. On government spending, there were various measures he announced because this is the budget that unites spending and taxation and duties. NHL, uh, NHS, national health spending, is to go up by over a billion in 96. Further private finance, uh, this is the initiative to get private money into doing public work that was normally done by government, would provide an extra 700 million investment, but over three years. Government spending on schools, he said would also go up by 878 million in the coming year and the money would be provided for an extra 5,000 police officers over the next three years. And finally he said this budget builds on the hard-won gains this government has made and keeps Britain on course to be the enterprise centre of Europe. Well no doubt we shall hear some argument about whether that is a true definition of it. But those are the main measures in the budget. Now let's hear from Peter who is better and who's worse off as a result. By right, David, what we're going to do now is balance the indirect tax increases on cigarettes on fuel uh, against the direct tax cuts and see what the effect is for a good cross-section of families. So let's take another flying trip uh, into Budget Town, the BBC's Budget Town, our model to describe how things have gone for people, past the shops in which of course we're going to find some things more expensive, uh, certainly in the tobacconist, uh, and round first of all to start with an unemployed couple living down the end of town. Uh, the unemployed couple will be of course unaffected by the tax changes because they pay no tax. Of course, benefits will be uprated in April as usual, so they will, uh, their income will rise from April. But the effect of the indirect tax changes, because we assume they take a basket home of uh, uh, cigarettes and drink, of course, no drink is not going to affect them because drink is not up, uh, but they are going to cost, they're going to have more to pay in terms of cigarettes. So the net effect on them is that they're £1 and fivepence worse off, a typical unemployed couple, uh, than they were before this budget. Let's go down the road now and look at the pensioner couple on £7,000 a year. There they are in their small terraced house, £7,000 a year, the pensioner couple, a bit better off because of the raising of the thresholds, 47 pence a week, these are all weekly changes, that's a tax cut, that's a bonus of £47 there, worse off however because of indirect tax changes, they smoke a couple of packets, 15 pence a packet, more expensive cigarettes, uh, so on balance 17 pence a week worse off. If they don't smoke of course they'll be 47 pence a week better off. Let's go up the road now and look uh, at some uh, earning uh, couples, some earning families. First of all, a family here with one person in the family earning £12,000 a year. The direct tax impact on them, £2.86 better off. Don't forget the thresholds are raised. The lower rate is expanded uh, by a little more than inflation. Uh, and also, of course, the basic rate is down uh, one penny to 24 pence. £2.86 better off, worse off, again, there's cigarettes and a bit of fuel for the car, £1.05. The net effect, £1.81, uh, better off the £12,000 a year a family. Up now to look at the family on average earnings. Semi-detached size up the road. Uh, and what are they, what's going to happen to them? Well, the direct tax cut means that they're better off by £4.21. Again, this basic rate of one pence on every pound beginning to cut in here and help them with a direct tax cut. The higher you earn, the more that basic rate helps. A basic rate cut helps. Indirect tax, uh, they drive a car. Uh, so petrol costs more, the cigarettes cost more, £1.50. Take one away from the other and you get a, a better off picture there for them of £2.71. They get an effective tax cut in this budget of £2.71 uh, and that is average earnings. Now a bit above average, up to the rather more prosperous family up the road in the detached house. Here they are with £30,000 a year. They are a direct tax cut, £10.33, that basic rate now affecting them. Also the higher rate threshold is up. The indirect tax, £1.58 worse off, they drive a rather larger car, uh, £8.75 better off each week as a result of the Chancellor's measures. And now, finally, let's go across the road past the shops to the manor house just round the corner uh, where a rather prosperous couple live uh, on £100,000 a year. What's going to happen to them? Well, the direct tax cut, £10.33. Uh, better off. The 40% rate remains at 40%, otherwise, of course, they'd have gained massively. Uh, the, the indirect tax extra, they're going to pay a fuel in their very large car, 
uh, three pounds 32 a week worse off the net effect for them seven pounds and a penny uh, better off as a result of this budget so on the whole the better off you are uh, up to a level of uh, 40 50 thousand pounds uh, the more you make out of the budget but everybody gains a little bit of course except people who don't pay any tax at all david the, 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 um, they're, they're all fine and dandy, Peter, but the only problem is that every single family, every single person is different and nobody ever fits the, the things you show there. I mean, you only have one earner in a family, not two earners. You don't That's take account right. of the number of children or anything like that. Well, we've got news for them, David. They'll be glad to hear that although we may not have given the right example precisely for them, we are for the first time plugged into the internet. So if any of you are plugged into the internet, don't despair, because we can do something for you. First of all, we're going to have a whole World Wide Web uh, of uh, guides to the budget, the background, the detail. Peter Jay has contributed to this, all sorts of uh, descriptions and explanations. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has contributed to. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, who helped us work out all these calculations, uh, we've got them over there, their uh, chaps are working away, their team is working away in the background there, and they are ready to help you, each of you personally, with your uh, calculations as to what this budget means for you. Now, all you have to do is to contact the following address. Let me just write it up there below the screen. There we are. HTTP colon slash slash www dot bbc dot co dot I hope you've got good eyes. UK slash budget. Got that? Lots of slashes and dots. Good. If you go in there, you will be asked by the computer to tell it what your precise personal circumstances are, it'll then work it all out for you, and the brilliance of the IFS will give you this budget's effect on you. David. I have a funny feeling UK slash budget won't be putting you out of business just <laughs> quite yet. But anyway, for those who are on the internet, goodbye. <laughs> Let's talk about the budget itself and the broad thrust of it. Um, first of all, Peter Jay, you were saying what you thought he should do. Has he done anything like what you thought he should do? Chancellor said that his budget was neutral. He doesn't seem to have noticed or to acknowledge that the recovery has come to an end. He talked confidently about what the economy was doing. He forecasts that it's going to rise by three and a quarter percent uh, between the first half of next year and the first half of the following year. But he has in fact increased the budget deficit relative to what he said this time last year for next year by nine and a half billion pounds and he's increased it for each of the subsequent four years by uh, up to ten billion pounds. He's in fact put the deficits back up very much to what they were at the end of his first budget uh, two years ago. Now, if we construe this as being neutral in the sense that these increases in the deficit are the operation of what Nigel Lawson used to call the automatic stabiliser. When the economy goes down, well, less revenue comes in, the government automatically goes into deficit, that automatically begins to push the economy back up again. If we, if we define that as neutral, then if the economy is to perform anything like as well as he says it's going to over the next 12 months, we would have to assume that he's relying entirely on monetary policy, which the first time I can remember in about 30 odd years, he didn't mention monetary policy in the budget speech at all, but he must in practice be relying on monetary policy, i.e. interest rate changes, reductions, in order to supply uh, the growth, which appears to be, which he forecasts, but appears to be lacking from the measures that he actually announced. Would you agree with that, Patricia Bowers? I think that the only concern I've, I've had for this budget is, has it still left room for this interest rate cut? Because it seems to me it's the only thing that's likely to stimulate this growth pattern that he's promising us. So you'd look to an interest rate cut this, this Thursday or tomorrow or whenever? I would hope so, yes. John Monks. Well, the other thing he didn't mention was unemployment. And the fact that unemployment is still well over two million. And the, he seems to be relying upon the, uh, the recovery to continue. And I very much agree with Peter Jay that it's a very, very optimistic view that he's taken of our economic prospects. The economy, if not actually ending, is clearly stuttering uh, in terms of the recovery phase. And to think somehow that the unemployed uh, will, in a sense, look after themselves at uh, what is a tinkering around with tax uh, budget seems to me uh, to be very, very strange indeed. I'm very disappointed. I think he's ignored the unemployed. I think he's uh, really turning a blind eye to the true state of the economy. There's nothing in it for industry. And the three percent growth, growth he says he's going to get next year is of no, no uh, help. Well, I mean, I don't believe he's going to get that. Right. Not without some uh, greater action than he's taken so far. Right. Let's turn to the taxation measures, John Whiting. What would you draw attention to? What, uh... yeah, there's some good interesting things there. For a while, I must admit, I thought this was a budget for the non-smoking classic car driver who went to the 
to a Scotch drinking party on the Northern Line, but then he got going, and leaving aside the headline uh, income tax cut, the 1%, he spread his income tax cuts quite well with an increase in the thresholds. He's also given some very welcome help, I think, to people who are looking at long-term care, which has very clearly worried a lot of people, and I think he's done a lot of good with that at no great cost. Smoothed out taxation of savings as well. An odd little thing, saying that savings income will only be taxed at 20%, really costs virtually nothing, because most people uh, get it either at 20% with dividends or 25% and fail to collect the tax back on uh, that. So, I think there's a good mix of packages there. But possibly, uh, to pick up John Monks's point, he could have given more to industry. And I suspect industry will be a little disappointed at uh, lacking of cuts in corporation tax. And uh, of course, he's said no investment allowances to come as well. Let's just stick with the, with the economics of it for a moment. Uh, Andrew Britton, do you think the Chancellor's been too timid? I do slightly, yes. I think that his uh, forecast for growth next year is on the optimistic side. And if he'd taken uh, a rather more pessimistic view of the growth prospects, he would have seen the need for rather more uh, than a neutral budget. But I'm pleased to see that he has not cut public expenditure substantially. There was a risk, I think, that he would use this budget to cut back uh, public spending, which would have really damaging social consequences. Um, he's resisted that, and I'm pleased to say, see that he has. I think he could, nevertheless, have given a bit of more away in taxation I think he's been cautious, and he may come to regret that as the economy slows down. Well, Ruth Lee, uh, you were saying earlier on you were very worried about the scale of borrowing I that, was, that the government yes. was going mm. for. What do you think now? Well, I think that is why he's been so cautious, because after all, we've now seen him say that PSPR is going to be 29 billion for this financial year, which is well up on the forecast he had in June. I think I said it was about 30 billion when we talked earlier. And very interestingly, he's actually saying that even with this sort of, only with these cuts in taxes and with 3% growth in GDP, which I admit I think does look optimistic, you're actually going to have a PSPR next year of 22 and a half billion, which is nearly 10 billion higher than what he was saying 12 months ago. And I think it's that sort of thing that's actually said to himself, he cannot do much more by way of fiscal stimulus because actually the markets will start losing confidence in him. And I think it's the, it's the fear of the markets, it's the fear of loss of confidence from the markets that's made him act as cautiously as it has well, done. What would you have liked him to do? Well, actually, uh, again, going back to what I said earlier, uh, he's actually done basically what I wanted him to do. In other words, stick to reasonable fi fiscal rectitude. Uh, what tax cuts we do have, he's going to have out of public expenditure cuts. I'm nearly certain there will be an interest rate cut at some point. And as I said earlier, too, I'm not quite as pessimistic as some of the other commentators about the state of the economy for next year. I do look to these windfalls to receipts to help the economy quite a bit and there should be a pickup in the global economy which again should help our exports. But 3% I do, I do concede, I think that looks on the high side. Peter Spencer, is this a, um, a dull budget to be followed by a more exciting one in the immediate run-up to a general election? I think this is dull, it is disappointing, but it's a very clear pointer to their election strategy. What we've seen is a Chancellor bending over backwards to reassure voters' doubts about the welfare state. And I think that that will score him votes. Uh, but the problem is that this comes both through efficiency gains and through his own generosity. And that generosity, together with the poor performance of the economy, has left absolutely no scope for any net stimulus to the economy. And that leaves us all feeling very insecure about our jobs. So it's very good on those doubts about welfare, but does absolutely nothing about our doubts about the economy and job security. Well, we're joined now, I think, by uh, John Redwood, I hope, from the da down at Westminster. No, he's not there yet. Oh, he is there. John, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, thank, you, thank, you for, thank you for joining us. Well, now, you were calling for five billion cuts in public spending and cuts in tax commensurate. What's your reaction to this budget, then? Well, I've got two-thirds of what I was asking for, so I think it's a very good down payment. I think we do need another budget next year along the same lines to return more money to the pockets of the nation. I'm very pleased that he is giving more money to schools and hospitals. People will welcome that. Very pleased he's adjusted the share scheme so that those in lower paid jobs can get the benefit of share participation where their employers want to make that available. Very pleased he's done quite a bit on income tax, particularly for the lower paid. I'm very happy quite a lot of that has been done by way of allowances, which was a route I favoured. What about housing? Well, I would have liked to have seen special measures on housing. Uh, the Chancellor says that all will be well. 
uh, if we keep interest rates low. And I think he may well have created conditions in which the next move in interest rates can be downwards. This is certainly a very prudent and cautious budget. Uh, he's not taking any undue risks with the financial markets. Do you think it's too prudent and that he won't get the growth of 3% that he's talking about? Well, I hope he'll get the growth. I mean, certainly uh, the money supply figures have been quite lively. I don't think I'm as gloomy as uh, Peter Jay in his prognosis that the economy is never going to grow again. Uh, but we'll have to watch and see. And if it doesn't work out quite as the Chancellor hopes, he can always cut interest rates, which would do the job. And is there anything else that you would like to have seen there or that you think uh, ought to be there perhaps next time round? Well, I would Mar like Mar to have seen a bit Mar more. Mar yes, couples, so I would have liked to see the married couples allowance uh, increase more than he did increase it by. Uh, that would have been one of the ways that I would have made up five billion instead of uh, three and a bit billion. All in all, do you think this is um, an election-winning budget, or do you expect that to come next year? I think it's a down payment. I think we need another budget next year which delivers more of the same, good management and lower taxes. John Redwood, thank you very much indeed. And now we're joined by Robin Oakley, our political editor. Robin, what's the Tory reaction? seemed rather subdued when he announced his one penny cut in income tax. Not the great waving of order papers we're used to. No, politics is a crude old business, and I think the problem is that the Chancellor had lost the expectations battle before he delivered this budget. He <coughs> hadn't been able to keep the expectations down. A lot of Tories were looking for something a bit more exciting, a bit more arresting than this. By being responsible, keeping uh, his, his tax cuts um, to uh, a respectable sort of level. He's failed to, to give them something really exciting to take back to their constituencies and something to wipe out the Labour campaign against this budget, which will point out, as Tony Blair started doing, uh, that tax increases produced by this government have been the equivalent of 7p in the pound, and this is only 1p off the standard rate. It did need something more than that, I think, psychologically, to give the Tories the kind of lift they were looking for. But there's some quite careful targeting of some of the areas where Tories have been losing support. Grey power, uh, pensioner votes, they've been not doing very well there. Well, the measures for helping with the residential care of the elderly will, I think, improve their fortunes uh, among older voters. Also, some fairly careful targeting of the small business sector where the Tories had been losing some support. But overall, I think from the kind of things that Tories were saying to me before this budget, they will feel a little bit disappointed. The Chancellor is saying he wants to be judged in a year's time. People aren't going to wait that long to judge his budget. <coughs> but Robin, isn't his uh, problem, you say he failed to meet the expectations, that the expectations were all put about by people on the right of the party who had a different agenda from him. There was no way he could meet them. That is one of the problems that he's faced, certainly. There are, there are no great friends uh, of the Chancellor's on the Tory right. They don't like what he stands for on Europe. They weren't going about to make his life any easier. But perhaps there should have been more of a counter-attack from the Chancellor's friends to say that these expectations were ludicrous and that they were never going to come to pass. Well, what's your assessment of how it will affect the voters' opinion, because we've been hearing all day about what voters in the country want and Tory supporters want. We shall have to wait a little bit longer, obviously, to see what the voters really say about this, but my expectation, uh, again, because of the, the level of expectations that have spread in the country, is that this budget won't have any kind of immediate effect in terms of lifting the government's standing in the opinion polls. Budgets actually very rarely do have that dramatic an effect on the opinion polls, and I think there may be a seepage effect over a period. It may help uh, over a period to induce that feel-good factor, but there's a, not a lot here to address immediately the job insecurity, which I think is one of the things really sapping the government standing in the country. Were you a bit surprised by it? I was a little surprised that there wasn't a bit more panache, a little bit more style, a little bit more dash about it, because this is a, a heavily political Chancellor who is no mean performer in the House of Commons, and I think he'd chosen to present himself in a pretty sober light today and not to go for any fireworks. Robin, thank you very much. Peter Spencer, you're listening to Robin Oakley there. What do you think the effect on public opinion and opinion polls is likely to be? Certainly this provides the acid test. Voters have been telling us all week that what they want are better services and job security, not lower taxes. And of course, that is precisely what this Chancellor has given us. We have had a lot of reassurance on welfare, very little on job security, and very little by way of tax or perhaps even lower interest rates with that PSBR problem. So you mean if the public were telling the pollsters the truth, they should be very happy with what they've got? Then this is a different election strategy to the one that applied in 1992, and if the voters really mean what they say, then it should be successful. 
Right. Well, let's now uh, turn from the overall strategy of the budget and look at some of the particular measures and how they affect industry and how they affect businesses. We heard, for instance, the reduction after a long campaign from the Scotch Whiskey Association in the duty on spirits, which were out of line, and they um, reacted by issuing their congratulations, the Scotch Whiskey Association, to the Chancellor. Um, and we're joined now by Jerry Fowden of the Bass Breweries, his Chief Operating Officer. Now, you, you've not only had, uh, I, I assume you deal with whiskey as well as beer and wine in Bass Breweries nowadays. We wholesale some whiskey, That's but right. really our main interest is that of making and selling our beer brands. So what's your reaction? You must be very pleased by all this. Well, no, actually we're disappointed. A, a freeze really isn't enough in the UK. Uh, if you look at duty in the UK, it's about 30p on a pint of beer. In France, it's 4.2p. So we're still going to have this million pints a day coming over with the bootleggers. What proportion of people really have the time, energy, um, uh, to make the effort to cross the channel to buy their weekly beer and wine? I mean, what proportion of the total, because you're always going on about this, of the total UK spending is spent in France instead of in Britain? Well, of the beer that's drunk at home, the stuff in small bottles and cans, about 15% of all the beer drunk at home is now coming in through a combination of personal impulse and the bootlegging trade. And that equals 4% of the total beer market, but 15% of everything that's drunk at home. So very sizable. So uh, you, you would want him to, re I mean, you failed really where the Scotch whiskey people have succeeded, is what you're yes, saying. Yes, we would want him to continue uh, to reduce the price of beer, the duty on beer in the UK, down to a level equal with Europe. Let's provide jobs for our people in this country and help our industry. In total, if you look at pubs and the brewers together, 900,000 jobs rest on the beer and pub industry in the UK. And it's those jobs that are at threat with around 10,000 pubs likely to close if this level of duty stays at such an imbalance, seven times different in the UK versus that in France. Thank you very much indeed. Well, here's the quote I mentioned earlier on from the Scotch Whiskey Association. There we are, congratulating the Chancellor. And um, they've been campaigning endlessly to get the duty down, and uh, they got it down by 4%, or 27 pence, on a bottle of whiskey. So don't buy it now, buy it after six o'clock is the rule. So let's just turn to other measures. Patricia Vaz, from the point of view of consumption of the high street, Christmas coming, how is this going to affect, this budget going to affect? Is it going to have any effect? I think it's like, it is likely to stimulate a little bit of excitement, I suppose. But to be honest, overall, I think people are still going to be too concerned about their longer term future to be able to go out and blow their £10 a week extra that they're going to get. Um, even if they're at the top end of the wages end area. Um, they're probably more interested in, in some of the other things that were announced this afternoon. And I certainly think from my company's perspective anyway, the changes to the share save scheme was very welcome. 99% of our people hold shares in our company. And for them, that change of three, from five to three years is going to be very welcome. Just explain how that will work to their advantage. What, well, what will because, happen? Um, at the moment, it's quite, um, quite off-putting to have to commit to five years for saving in a share-save scheme, particularly if you're one of the younger people who perhaps for five years is a long time for one of our younger employees. And it, we've always tried to encourage this ownership of shares within our company, and to, particularly in the save-as-you-earn schemes. So bringing that restriction down to three years is going to be quite more, a lot more attractive to most Three years before employees. you can dispose? Before you can dispose, yes, and still maintain your tax-free allowance. Mm. John Whiting, that's right, is, John, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Is, is, is this going to make a big difference to saving? And yes, I think it is. I mean, mm. we're talking about the share option scheme that you are required to save towards. Yeah, and as Patricia right. says, I mean, just basically saying to people, you only have to lock up your money for three years before you can potentially realise a gain and then go off and use it again. That's much better than saying it was five or indeed seven as it once was. Mm. Add to that the executive share option scheme which now comes down to if you like almost an all employee share option scheme uh, a limit of 20,000 that the company be it British Telecom or anybody can give and that again I think is a good encouragement to mm. wider share ownership and I think it'll be widely welcomed I mean we saw comments in the summer in the wake of the Greenbury report that the blocking of share options was welcome at the very high level but what is needed is to encourage everybody to participate. And that I think the Chancellor has usefully done. And what about profit-related pay? Because it was thought he might 
changed the arrangements yes. on that. I mean, profit-related pay, maybe that's another of the hairs. He shot a few hairs that uh, possibly the media had been uh, uh, chasing around, like, no, I'm not going to tax the redundancy pay, the first 30,000. That, I'm sure, would be very welcome. But profit-related pay, many people are expecting some sort of restriction on that. But really, it's so well ingrained now. A lot of people are benefiting, it, benefiting 20 percent or more. And uh, indeed, I think the unions are encouraging it, as uh, possibly John Monks will confirm. It's well regarded. It's a useful benefit. And I think it's now going to be very difficult for the Chancellor to stop it or block it in any way. John Monks, what do you make of the, of the changes, both on shares and share acquisition and uh, share schemes, which he announced £20,000, uh, mm. up to £20,000 limit, <coughs> well, I think and, and profit-related pay? Some people say profit-related pay is just something that... The, that uh, employees have now got into the habit of having um, and have calculated carefully how much of their pay should be in profit-related schemes and getting it tax-free. Well, I don't think anybody should uh, overestimate the impact of uh, these kind of schemes on uh, people's motivation. They can be a useful adjunct and there's no doubt that they've developed in recent years, but I think you're absolutely right to suggest that uh, they're, they're part of the total package that people not necessarily take for granted, but they do see that they are a useful adjunct to the the package that they get. My particular test of this budget though is really what is it doing to make people feel more secure? What is it doing to uh, make them feel that they might have a job next year and so on? And I don't think that, that uh, necessarily that feeling will come through at all from this uh, budget and what the Chancellor has done today. I'm sure that the overall effect will be disappointing. I think industry will look at the investment uh, proposals here <coughs> and won't believe too much in this PFI initiative. Uh, there's a billion pounds unspent from last year's allocation because of blockages in the system and uh, the idea that this is going to lead to some takeoff of public investment I think is totally wrong. So far it's been a big disappointment. Are you against it in principle? No, I'm not against in, it in, in principle. The, in the I just think the kind of rules which are being applied in the Treasury are, are very constraining to the initiative and I've not got any great faith that this is going to be a big release of projects which it could see through. And I think, again, the unemployed are the real ones who are missing out totally from this budget. Ruth Lee, can we just stick with uh, the, the effects on capital, share ownership, profit rate pay? What was your reaction to the measures? Well, I was very pleased to see the increased uh, relief for the particular share options. And in particular, talking about these executive share options up to 20,000, what you're really seeing is going back to the situation before we had the changes to these in, in the mid-July. And what happened then is that the Chancellor changed the taxation from uh, taxing on capital gains on sale to income tax on exercise. And that's, of course, what we in the IOD actually did re represent quite heavily against. So we're very, very pleased to see that he's gone back to a sort of pre-mid-July situation for those executive share options up to a threshold of 20,000. And I think there were some other measures actually he made in his speech which were quite helpful to small businesses. We obviously welcome the extension of the inheritance tax reliefs and we welcome the extension of the capital gains tax reliefs. Perhaps he's not gone as far as we'd like him to go, but at least he's gone some way to meeting what we do want because we've been uh, very much against the capital taxes. They cut into the capital that small businesses can have, the small businesses, the capital they need to invest and to thrive. So insofar as he has given more relief on, on capital taxes, we absolutely welcome it. Good. Well, thank you very much. Let's just have a look, uh, as a reminder, for those of you who may just come in, the budget statement lasted uh, just over an hour. Rather short, really. It didn't reach Disraeli's 45 minutes, but he had to do both government spending and um, government taxation plans as well. And mercifully, he didn't reach Gladstone's four hours, 45 minutes, which would have had us here for a long, long time. I don't think anybody will ever do that again. But let's just have a look, for those of you who've come in, at the measures that have been announced. Just as a reminder, here they are. The income tax basic rate is cut by one pence, one penny, to 24 pence. The 20 pence ban, that's the lower rate of income tax, is wind, widened by 700 pounds to 3,900 pounds when you move into the basic rate. The 40% threshold goes up. It's raised 1,200 pounds to 25,500. He said too many people were entering that top rate threshold. The personal allowance goes up by £240. That's a bit more than the rate of inflation indexing would have had it. And then uh, on the other side of uh, tax raising and fundraising and duty raising, there's no change on beer and no change on wine. Spirits go down by 4%, 27 pence on a price of the bottle of whiskey from 6 o'clock tonight. And extra strong cider, by contrast, goes up by 8 pence a pint because it was thought to be, the duty was thought to be too low, but not until next October. And tobacco, 
Cigarettes up 15 pence, cigars up sixpence, pipe tobacco up eight pence. And on uh, transport taxes, petrol, diesel, and unleaded petrol all go up by three and a half pence straight away. And furthermore, super unleaded goes up by an extra four pence a litre next May. The car road tax goes up by five pounds to 140 pounds, but elderly cars, old bangers, are going to be totally exempt from car road tax because they're often kept in garages and only taken out for a spin once in a while, according to the Chancellor. And then changes on long-term care for the elderly. The upper asset limit for financial help is doubled. It goes from 800 to 16, uh, 8,000, I should say, sorry, to 16,000 uh, pounds. That's the figure that uh, uh, you can, you can ha hold up to in savings before you cease to gain public support or NHS support for uh, going into a home. And the income from long-term care insurance policies is going to be exempt from tax. All measures to try and encourage, and we'll be talking about it in a moment with a representative of age concern to see exactly what the impact will be. Businesses, the, uh, the um, tax on depositing waste in holes in the ground has led to a cut in the employer's national insurance of a magnificent 0.2 percent goes to 10 percent from 10.2 employers pay their share of national insurance on all earnings of their employees and that takes effect from April 1997 land for landfill tax has led to that small companies corporation tax goes down 1 percent to 24 percent from 25 and well there is the landfill tax at the bottom seven pounds a ton and if it's non-toxic it's about two pounds a ton so those are the main changes that the Chancellor announced. Now let's go down to the House of Commons and uh, join some backbenchers who've been listening to that, who are in the House of Commons. Peter Temple Morris, first of all, um, from Lempster, you're thought to be on the left of the party. What was your reaction to what the Chancellor did? Were you worried that it wasn't sufficiently stimulating to the economy? I think it was right. I think it was responsible politically. I, I was very pleased at the tax cuts. I think it's part of a continuing process to get the economy going well and truly next year. Responsible, socially responsible, I would add, taking a large number out of tax as well as reducing the standard rate. Uh, as well as all that, I think many good things with education, budget, law and order, increases in public expenditure. So I'm really rather pleased that this budget is part of a continuing process. It can, cannot be called political opportunism. But aren't you worried, if it's not political opportunism, that it may not have enough in it to uh, restore the fortunes or even begin the restoration of the fortunes of the Conservative Party? Well, one of the things, it may be strange uh, for you to hear this from me, may be, but one of the things I most welcome is that this budget clearly cares and minds about the country and its people. It's not about doing something which we cannot sustain by cutting too much too soon for political reasons. It's a responsible budget. I think also, and this is an important point, it opens the way for a reduction in interest rates, which I would like to see. Do you have any idea what kind of reduction you're expecting to get and whether you'll get one in the immediate future? I would have thought we're talking weeks, but I've no idea what the reduction would be, but I think it could be very significant for the economy and then would complete the picture, the overall picture, as far as this budget is concerned. You give a very flattering picture of what the Chancellor has done. Is there anything you would like to have seen that wasn't there? I'd obviously like to have uh, spent more on, on various social causes, but we haven't got the money. We've also got to get the economy moving in order to produce the money to pay for everything which we want to have. So therefore, I really do welcome it. I might, when I see the small print, be very concerned over things like the foreign office budget. I don't know. Aid is apparently going to be protected. BBC World Service, British Council, those sort of areas I want to see looked after. But that's a matter for me when I look at the small print. I'm pleased with this budget. Peter Temple Morris, thank you. Well, standing next thank to you is Graham. Riddick, the MP for Cone Valley and a supporter of John Redwood in his challenge for the leadership. Um, Mr. Riddick, the Chancellor referred disparagingly to those in the party who wanted slash and burn on public spending. I don't know whether you call yourself a slasher and burner, but were you happy with the scale of reduction that he got or would you have wanted him to go further? Well, last week I called for tax cuts of at least five billion, but uh, I very much welcome the fact we've been able to reduce taxes at all. It has to be said that over the last three years, it's been very difficult for Conservative backbenchers. We backbenchers, we've been uh, having to increase taxes so as to balance the books, and now we're being able to reverse 
that process. And of course, as Peter Temple Morris has said, the fact that he hasn't increased taxes by as much as five billion, I think does provide more scope to reduce interest rates. And that, of course, is going to be very good news for uh, mortgage holders. But um, um, are you saying that you've, you, you felt in sympathy with what Kenneth Clark did? Well, I'm saying that I'm very pleased that we're now once again re-establishing ourselves as the tax-cutting party. Um, as I said, I perhaps would have liked five billion, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy indeed that we've now uh, embarked upon that process. And at the same time, we've been able to produce um, significant increases for those vital public services. So we're spending more money on schools, on hospitals, providing more policemen, and I think the general public will very much welcome that approach. Is your opinion then that the Redwood people got their way, that the Redwood campaign against Major has led to the, a budget of the kind we've got? Well, I don't have any doubt at all that John Redwood's campaign in the summer had a very positive effect. Um, John put forward a very positive program. Uh, he put forward some ideas as to how we could reduce public expenditure. And indeed, the Chancellor in this budget has embraced many of those ideas, introducing more private capital into the public sector uh, and reducing the overhead of government. And I think that's to be welcomed. So I think John Redwood has had a very, very positive effect uh, on the debate within the Conservative Party and the government. And yet we're hearing in this studio uh, from people who understand business and industry and the retail trade that it's not likely to lead to much of an improvement there. And we know also that it's not going to do much, as far as we know anyway, to help people with houses, with negative equity, because there was no measures there either, except for Myris not being changed. Well, I think homeowners will welcome the fact that there's a, a, a tremendous likelihood now of their mortgage rates being reduced. I would, I would expect to see interest rates coming down in the very near future. Uh, and so I think most people will welcome that. Uh, as far as business is concerned and retailers, you know, what we need to see and what we've had in recent years is economic stability. We don't want to see boom bust coming back again. We want to see steady low inflation, uh, low inflationary growth so that people could invest for the future. And I think that that is what the Chancellor is delivering. Graham Riddick, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. That was uh, Graham Riddick, two Tory backbenchers. Well, now I said earlier on that we would uh, go back to Tony Blair's speech while we were away here just explaining what was in the budget and we'll have more of that later on and fuller details from Peter Snow. We took the first part of, uh, of what Tony Blair said, but now let's go back to the Commons where he finished a few moments ago completed his response and there'll be Gordon Brown speaking later on. Indeed, we'll be able to speak to Gordon Brown in this programme, I think. But this is what uh, he had to say. What has been taken away? People after this budget will still remain since the last election as a result of the tax rises, £700 a year worse off. That is a fact. They can't deny it. They won power promising to cut tax year on year. They swore blind they would never raise it, and they have. Mortgage tax relief cut. National insurance contributions up. Mary Man's allowance cut. New taxes on insurance and households and holidays. VAT on fuel and power. Yes, Madam Speaker, they want us to forget about this. They don't want us to remind people of it. I'll tell the honourable gentleman, we will remind them of it from now till polling day because it's the truth. He also went on to challenge the Chancellor's figures. Of our economic prospects. Let us just analyse from his own red book for a moment the figures that he's given. He says that the growth rates are all booming. In actual fact, I think I'm right in saying he's had to revise downwards his growth rate for this year. Yeah. He says that investment is booming. Investment is set to rise, according to the figures released today, by 1%. The actual forecast on imports is that they will rise. He said we had a trade surplus with the Asian tigers. We have a trade deficit with the European Union that are our main partners. And all that despite a 25% devaluation of our currency under the Conservatives. Now that surely is a serious point. You would expect if the currency had been devalued, if the pound was less, worth 25% less than it was a couple of years ago, we would be able to be in trade surplus. But even now we're not able to achieve it. So these problems remain. 
Tony Blair also called for the windfall tax on private utilities Labour wants. He has opposed a windfall levy on the privatised utilities. I believe that is for one simple reason. They are the vested interests of the Tory party and they don't dare challenge them. The fact of the matter is that there are those excess profits there. The national grid sold a few days ago, worth five billion, sold for one billion. Half of the water companies pay no mainstream corporation tax at all. Electricity companies with record profits even at the height of the recession. I say that the case for taking on these vested interests and funding a decent education and employment programme for our young people was overwhelming. It was overwhelming and it should have been done. And if it had been done, if it had been done, then we could have made a real attack on the root causes of higher welfare under this government, which is higher unemployment, higher social decay, higher social breakdown. Many of those people, those young people, who have been in this situation for years, looked for something from this budget and got nothing. He also attacked Conservative claims to be promoting they the interests of Britain. now know the British national interest if it got up and slapped them in the face. <laughs> Indeed, it does frequently and they still don't know it. They have given up on any serious vision for this country's future. They wanted to hail this budget as a turning point, but the British people know better. It is another milestone on their road to defeat, and the sooner, the better. Tony Blair, and we're now joined from Westminster by his shadow chancellor, Gordon Brown, by the Liberal Democrat Treasury spokesman, Malcolm Bruce, and by the Deputy Prime Minister, Michael Heseltine. Uh, Mr. Brown, I know you'll be speaking probably tomorrow on this, but you've now had a good hour, which is more than most people have had, to read through and cogitate. Um, the general view seems to be this is a cautious budget, a prudent one, uh, nothing outlandish. What have you got against it? Well, this is the budget of a government in virtually terminal decline. It's got nothing to offer the country, as Tony Blair just said. There is no vision about what we can do to prevent our slide from 13th to 18th place in the World Prosperity League. There is nothing there to deal with the huge problems of social division and youth unemployment. And there's nothing that gives people hope that the standards of living that have been falling for many months will actually rise again. Indeed, 7p minus 1p equals still 6 pence up on income tax as a result of all the tax changes since 1992. And people are about £700 still worse off. So there's nothing either for the future or the present or to undo the damage of the past. Do I uh, gather from your contempt for the small reduction in taxation that you will therefore be voting in favour of the one penny reduction in the well, standard rate? We, we will certainly not vote against it. I take the view that people have uh, suffered enough, that they have been penalised by this government for the economic failures of this government, uh, and it is a small compensation for the rise in national insurance, VAT, uh, the cuts in mortgage tax relief, the cuts in marriage couples allowances, all of which have survived and still stand after this budget. Indeed, the tax take next year will be higher, even after what are called tax cuts, than in 1979 when Labour left power. And I think it's a very sad commentary on the government that 16 years after they came to power, they're now slashing the hospital building programme by 16%. Investment is virtually stagnant at 1%. The trade balance is getting worse again. And people really have very little hope that there is any vision left within Whitehall, within the Cabinet, to be able to deal with the fundamental economic problems we still as a nation have to face. So just to clarify the point, you'll be supporting the tax changes promoted by the Chancellor, proposed we'll, by the we'll, Chancellor We'll the not budget. be voting against them. We will vote against the budget strategy as a whole because it is wrong. It doesn't deal with the fundamental problems. But as far as the 1p cut in income tax, we will let that through because I take the view that people have suffered enough. They have been penalised by this government. I myself think there were fairer ways of doing it, VAT on fuel to be cut, uh, looking at uh, a, a lower tax ban, but of course the government have got no vision left uh, even when they look at the tax system. Uh, Michael Heseltine, you've got the shadow chancellor saying he's not going to oppose any of the tax changes that you've made. Uh, does that make you encouraged or does it make you think perhaps it's a bit of a mealy-mouthed budget, not one to stir up the Tory ranks? No, it merely means that whatever we do today, Labour follows suit. The essence of what the Chancellor has announced today is that the average uh, income 
uh, earner will be nine pounds a week better off next year than they are today. That's a very important increase in real living standards. And if you couple that with the fact that we're spending well over 800 million pounds extra on education, well over a billion pounds more on the health service, putting 5,000 policemen more onto the beat, you'll realize what we've done is a combination of two things. One is to help the important public programs where we wanted to improve the quality and the scale. And the second is to help people by giving them a higher living standard than they would have had before this budget, as I say, to the tune of nine pounds a week, against a background of the overarching vision of turning this country into the enterprise center of Europe which all overseas companies recognize and understand and that's why they're pouring their investment into Gordon's constituency, into Tony Blair's constituency, Samsung, Siemens, one after the other. Do you know there are more American banks in the city today than there are in New York, more Japanese banks here than there are in Tokyo, more manufacturing coming into this country than any other part of the European but, Union but because we are the enterprise center of Europe. Yeah, but even with your one penny give back, you've still taken sixpence more in the pound from voters. People would expect you to be able to oh, do yes, something, you see, something useful with it, wouldn't to, they? You, want, it's, it's, I think you can't, you can't falling, claim credit for it. Into, it's the, you you're can't, falling into Labour's trap. No, I'm not falling into any trap. I'm falling into my own trap, if anything. I'm saying you can't claim like, credit for it. If you, if you, want, if you take I, sixpence I in the pound, you must be able to do something with it. I that people will be nine pounds a week better off next year as a result of what's been announced today with taking into account income and inflation. If you take the figure since the last election, the figure is 14 pounds a week better off, taking all things into account. Perfectly true, of course. If you say, well, what about the, airco uh, the airport tax, where we tax foreigners for their flights in and out of this country, that is a new tax. But taking it overall, people's living standards next year will be nine pounds a week on average better off. That is the totality of what the Chancellor is talking about today. Do, do you believe you're going to be able to get the growth? Because there's some scepticism from oh, our yes. experts well, whether... whether can that. I just finish the question, yes, Mr. Hildebrand? Sorry. Just let me finish, then I'll let you finish. Uh, th whether you'll be able to get growth of 3% on these figures? Yes, well, if you look at the uh, overseas commentators, you'll see how much confidence they've got in our economy. The Chancellor is talking about 3%. 3% is uh, a, 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 a level of in increase in growth in our economy that we can sustain. This is not an irresponsible budget. This is about keeping Britain growing as one of the fastest growing economies in Western Europe whilst people benefit and whilst we enhance the critical public services. Michael Heseltine, thank you very much. Malcolm Bruce, Treasury spokesman for the Liberal Democrats, is there beside you. Now, you wanted tax increases, so presumably the Liberal Democrats will be voting against, unlike Labour, voting against these tax cuts, will they? We certainly won't support the penny off the standard rate of income tax, but the reality is uh, that uh, what the Chancellor has done is a great ed ed edifice of creative accounting. He's actually proposing to borrow more next year than he did in last year's budget when he said the borrowing levels were so high that he had to put taxes up. So he's not found the money that justifies uh, these tax cuts, and he has not, uh, contrary to what Michael Heseltine said, found real additional money for education. The reality is that most of the extra money from education has to be funded by the local authorities out of an overall settlement which will not more than match inflation. The reality is, therefore, that any increase in the education funding coming from this government will be at the expense of care in the community and social services and other local authority spending. So that is a savage attack on education, not an investment in it, and in our view, the money that is being used this year to cut taxes should have gone into education to lay the foundations for an economic performance that could sustain tax cuts into the far future. This is a short-term uh, consideration, and the borrowing levels are really quite worrying. They're talking about borrowing levels in two years' time, three times what they were saying they would be a year ago. And why, does that, why does that worry you? Well, it worries us because if you don't get borrowing under control, you can't sustain lower taxes, and you can't keep interest rates down, and you can't keep inflation down. So all the boasts that the government have made about the level to which they have achieved uh, low inflation and low interest rates, and we welcome what has been achieved, but the extent to which they can deliver those in the future is being prejudiced by a risky budget now that's being driven by political considerations rather than the real long-term needs of the nation. And one of the things we have to do is invest properly in education, not try and fiddle the figures and put the pressure on local authorities who haven't got the money and the government know it. Malcolm Bruce, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's hear now from one or two people who've been directly affected or who represent bodies directly affected 
by fairly complicated alterations across the board, uh, particularly the old. And Sally Greengross, from, who is the Director of Age Concern, joins us now. Uh, Sally Greengross, could you first of all explain to us how an elderly couple listening to this program, perhaps thinking that they may have to go into care of some sort, perhaps already in care, will be affected by what the Chancellor has announced? Well, those who, like many, phone us up, or their families do, because they're so worried about the limits on assets, which mean that they'll have to pay towards their care and they just haven't got enough, they'll be pleased because the Chancellor's raised those limits considerably. So in order to be totally supported uh, by the state in residential or in nursing home care, um, the, the limit's gone up, the lower limit, from £3,000 to £10,000, and that's good news. And the upper limit, where you pay a bit towards your care, has gone up now um, to £16,000. What, what happens after £16,000 of, well, of assets? Th then you have to be prepared for your assets to be counted as part of the payment, and that's what's been worrying so many people, particularly those who have saved up and have managed to buy something, perhaps because of the encouragement to buy their own property, uh, maybe it was formerly council property, and they feel very aggrieved. Well, the government has said that they're, they're now going to do something. They're encouraging people already to buy long-term care insurance, and that's all right for the very small number of people who can afford it, but it is very expensive still. But the hopeful announcement there is that the government wants to explore partnership arrangements so that uh, people who are planning their future may be able to defer a bit of their pension when they retire and look at ways of helping to fund that care should they need it in innovative ways. And we're looking forward at Age Concern to being part of the consultative process to make sure that, that those sorts of schemes are available to a broader group of older people because at the moment we are talking about a tiny group. So, but so just, just, just explain to me, to, clar to clarify it or simplify it, say somebody has uh, a property that's worth let's say £50,000 or £30,000 and they decide to go into residential care. What actually happens? Are you saying that until their assets are reduced to 16000 they have to pay for it themselves? Well, the local is it as simple as that? It is as simple as that, really, that it, it will not mean that their house has to be sold immediately. Certainly it won't have to be if their husband or wife is still living there. But it does mean that the house can and probably will be taken into account after it's sold and, and if they die. So that if they were hoping to hand it on to their children, uh, the children aren't going to get what they expected. And this worries a lot of people. So I think that there are plans, and the Chancellor's really hinted at these, for, for new ways of looking at protecting that property, at least to some extent. So, and Sally Gurius, just, uh, just briefly, in, in summary, you, you, quite a good budget for the elderly, in well, your it, opinion. It's a good budget on the whole for the third of elderly people who, like everybody else who pays tax, are going to get um, more allowances and, and will pay less. We're waiting uh, with bated breath to see if uh, tomorrow Peter Lilly is going to do something spectacular for the majority of elderly people who still do depend on the state for pensions, income support and all the, the uh, necessities of life. And I hope very much that their term will come as well. Thank you very much indeed. Sally Greengross of Age Concern. Let's go back now to the London School of Economics. I said earlier they were poring over this budget in a group that studies these things to see their effect on particularly on women and on poorer people in society. Professor Moore, first of all, is the director of the group. Uh, how do you assess this budget? Well, your commentators have been emphasizing that this is a cautious budget in line with the political objectives of the government. What they haven't stressed is that it's also potentially a very damaging budget for women and children. The Chancellor seems to have chosen to tackle the problem of creating incentives to work simply by cutting benefit for some of the most vulnerable sections of the population, which include women and young, uh, young people. We've seen savings overall made from the Social Security budget. We've seen a potential freeze on single parent benefits. And we've seen restrictions on housing benefits for young people under the age of 25. Overall, I think that this is very much uh, a savers and investors budget. 
It uh, rewards people who have been in occupational pensions, who've been able to invest in personal equity plans and in TESAs. What it doesn't take into account is that women are amongst the lowest paid in the population. They're very often part-time workers. They're not in these occupational pension plans. They haven't been able to invest in personal equity plans and TESAs and so on. And I think that in the context of women not being savers, we have to look closely at something like the partnership schemes proposed for long-term care, where you can retain more of your assets over £16,000 if you've been able to invest in some kind of personal protection plan. We have to recognize that women are vulnerable here because the premiums for long-term care for women are approximately twice what they are for men. Right. Let, Let me move, move on, on to Ruth Lister from Loughborough. What do you read into what's uh, been said by the Chancellor? Well, it would appear that uh, the Chancellor is planning to phase out the special provisions for lone parents that are paid to those both in work and those on benefit. And that will These are the cash figures that come on top of child benefit? That's right. It comes yes. on top of child benefit for the one parent benefit and on top of the basic income support for the lone parents on income support, the lone parent premium, one parent benefit. And uh, it would appear that these will be phased out. Now, the, the Chancellor presented this as a kind of neutral measure. Um, and he made what I think was an extraordinary statement that the costs and responsibilities of caring for children are the same for couples and lone parents. And I think a lone mother hearing the Chancellor would be in dismay at his lack of understanding. Because the whole point of these benefits was to recognise that it is more difficult to bring up a child on your own. And to remove these benefits, even if only gradually by phasing them out, will push some of the poorest women and children further into poverty. All right. And Ray Ginn from the National Institute for Social Work. Uh, Jay Ginn, sorry. No, I called you Ray. Jay, uh, what, what's your reaction briefly to the budget? First of all, I'm afraid it's a disappointing budget for older women. More attention seems to be paid to elderly cars than to elderly people. There's nothing in the budget to address older people's main need, which is for a substantially higher basic state pension. And that's especially important to older women who are heavily reliant on the state pension because only a quarter have any occupational pension at all. And when they do have it, the amounts are much less than for men. So rather than reducing the employer's national insurance contribution, which is already the lowest in the European Union, the Chancellor should have increased it to fund a decent basic state pension for all older people. Cool. Secondly, I'd like to say that the higher threshold for paying for long-term care is a crumb of comfort for those who need institutional care, but they still have to sell their home and spend down until their assets are £16,000 before they get any state help at all. And it seems strange to be cutting inheritance tax in order to reward thrift while those who are unfortunate enough to suffer chronic illness or disability effectively have to pay a tax down to £16,000, while other people who are not sick can pass on £200,000 to their, their heirs. It seems there's no incentive to thrift at all if you're long-term sick. It's a tax on sickness. OK, thank you very much indeed. That's the London School of Economics giving their reaction. Now let's go to Birmingham and hear the reaction of people up there. We heard from the politicians, and some of them are there, but there are also people working in Leyland Daff, or the old Leyland Daff, Len Stone, who's the team leader. Mr Stone, what's your reaction to this budget? Do you think it's going to make your job any safer, make the sales of the trucks any easier, change your life? I don't think it'll change my life at all, but I think it, the job will be secure, and I also think that uh, the budget is good for the industry. We'll have steady growth, as Alan Amy said earlier, and people will buy more vans, especially the contract fleets. So are you all in all quite pleased with it? Or were, well, you, were you hoping for cuts in your own taxation on a bigger scale? On a personal view, I think I was expecting more. I think I was expecting it down to about 23p in the pound rather than 24. Uh, and I didn't expect the petrol to go up so much and the road tax, I thought you would have left alone, and the cigarettes and the alcohol, I, I thought, well, that's horrendous, really. That's killed the smoking industry. Well, you'll have to buy an old banger, won't you? And then you won't have to pay any excise <laughs> yeah, duty. Yeah. Well, sitting on your left is uh, Judith Worley, who's a nurse. Judith, uh, what's your reaction? 
Well, I'm, I'm concerned, as are some of the other people who've already spoken to you, about the effects on um, the, elder, the frail elderly in long-term care. And we wait till tomorrow for um, the definitive view about whether things like nursing care will be taken out of the, um, the, the budget for, for, for care for the elderly. I'm delighted, unlike my colleague, about the, the uh, tobacco tax. And I have to say, now is the time, of course, to grasp the nettle and ban tobacco advertising along with it, which will, I hope, help some of the healthcare issues that go with this. How the amount of money that's going to be put into the health service is, is actually spent is, is the one thing that we perhaps, I wouldn't say, dare hold our breath about uh, to see how we're going to improve what are, in some areas, quite abysmal services. But Nursing is putting through so many more patients. We are caring for more people and doing a good job but there's getting less and less of us. Do, do, what do you, what's your reaction to private money being used in the health service? The announcement Stephen Dorrell made today and that the Chancellor mentioned. Are you in favour of that? Not necessarily, because I do have a concern about just who is going to be providing this private money, just how it's going to be used and how they're going to use it to build new hospital units and whether we end up in what are going to be private buildings that, for what is supposed to be a public service. Um, Let's just go, thank you very much, Judith Wallen. Let's just go back to our politicians. Um, Bernard Zisman, first of all, satisfied with what you got from the Chancellor? Yes, I, I didn't want to see a bribing budget. I wanted to see a balanced budget. And I think that's what we've got. I, I had uh, hoped for a restoration of increases in personal allowances. We've got that. There's more bobbies on the beat. There's more money for schools, which a lot of people want to see. Uh, on a personal basis, I've just about sneaked into the pensioner bond bracket, so I'm quite pleased about that. And on the whole, I think that this is addressing the middle management, which I think is the group that has been most hardly hit, more hardly hit by what has gone on in the last few years. All right, Theresa Stewart, we heard from you before, the leader of Birmingham City Council. Do you think the Tories are on to a winner here? I don't in this city. Nearly half the people of Birmingham are on income support. They were looking for investment in jobs and training. I don't think they've got it. I welcome more money into the schools. I hope that when the full announcement comes, we'll be able to spend it without having to raise the council. Tax. OK. And John Hemming of the Liberal Democrats, your quick reaction, please. Basically, I'm very worried about crime, and three police per constituency won't make that much difference. They're borrowing to fund tax cuts. That's clear. There's a little bit of money for education, but not enough, and I'm, I'm worried that that will cause problems. All right, thank you very much. That's the view from Birmingham. Now, Peter, let's have another look at exactly how people are going to be affected by the Chancellor's measures, can we? And Quite then we'll come back so to this who's, table here. who's better off and who's worse off as a result of this budget? We're going to take a trip now down the main street of BBC's Budget Town. There it is. There's the pound in the middle and there's the shape of the our Budget Town model. And we're going to go down past the shops in which people will find at the garage there on the right that petrol is up and that... Uh, Tobacco is up. We're going to start by looking at the unemployed couple living uh, here with a change in direct tax. Uh, no change at all as a result of the direct tax. They, they pay their income tax down £1.05 because of the extra cost of cigarettes. Worse off then by £1.05. Up the road a bit to the uh, pensioner couple living in a terrace town. It's a bit further up the road in Budget Town. Uh, they're on £7,000 a year. Their tax allowances put them better off by 47 pence. Uh, two packets of cigarettes put them down 30 better off by just 17 pence a week, the pensioner couple. Now, let's go up and look at people who are actually earning. Uh, here they are earning fairly, uh, rather below average earnings, £12,000 a year. We find here they've got a £2.86 tax cut. They're worse off, though, because of the cost of uh, petrol and the cost of, more important, cigarettes in their case, uh, £1.81 better off each week. And now up to the couple on average earnings. And here we have a bit of a mystery because uh, Mr. Heseltine was talking about something like a £9 a week tax cut for them on the whole, on balance, better off by £9 a week. Well, we find that the direct tax change for them is £4.21, better off. Worse off because of the indirect tax increases. They drive a car. And they're actually better off by only £2.71. No sign of £9 there. Let's go up, a, up the earnings scale a bit, though, up to £30,000 a week year and here we have this uh, living in the detached house up the road we have this couple here on thirty thousand pounds a year they are better off because of the ten pound thirty three direct tax uh, cut that they get and their indirect tax is up by one pound fifty eight the net effect on them is eight pound seventy five 
better off. And finally, the £100,000 a year uh, couple over the road in the rather plush house uh, out on the west side of town. This couple on £100,000, uh, the direct tax changes for them, the raising of the threshold, the reduction of the basic rate and so on, up £10.33, uh, worse off by £3.32, driving a mighty big car, £7 on a penny, better off each week. So no sign there on the level of average earnings anywhere, not with any reach of it, uh, of that £9 that uh, Mr Heseltine was saying that they'd be better off each week. David. Peter, thank you very much. We've got a couple of minutes before we end, so let's just go round the table again and get a final reaction. Andrew Britton, first of all, to this budget as a whole. I think the budget as a whole is uh, on a smaller scale than most people expected, that the, the uh, tax cuts were not very large. This ought to open the way to cuts in interest rates within the next few months, and that is now my hope, to stimulate the economy. John Whiting. Yes, it's a good budget, some good bits for most people, aiming undoubtedly for some uh, in interest rate cuts, but underneath it all there's still a terrific amount of detail in the budget resolutions, uh, national insurance for the self-employed reformed a little, which creeps out in some of the detail, and even VAT payments on account for the large companies change. So one has to look at the detail, as always. And that'll take a week or two? It, well, no, it'll Keep take... All, business for a bit. No, it'll take me all night, no right. mind about the week. <laughs> John Monks. Well, a modest, even timid uh, budget in terms of its impact on the British economy. And one of the things I've just been looking at is uh, one of the, uh, the Chancellor did touch upon the fact that the, there are going to be big cuts in the civil service over the next period, and the cuts in operational costs, as he put it, will fuel some of the tax cuts that we've seen. That's not going to do a lot for middle Britain's insecurity as jobs are cut in the public services. And I think overall he's not done anything like enough for the unemployed. OK, Ruth Lee, briefly. Well, I think the first thing is it's clearly a very cautious budget that the Chancellor has been very concerned about because of his borrowing and he's, uh, he's if the financial markets have almost been like uh, Marley's ghost tapping on his shoulder all the time. He's obviously worried about that. But having said that, I think his uh, signs of f fiscal rectitude are right. I think he's made some very good decisions for business. I like his uh, extra tax reliefs in capital taxes and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see the share options changes as well. Peter Spencer, very briefly, if you would. This is a neutral budget. That means, I'm afraid, that it's neither one thing nor another. We've not seen a big cut in the PSBR. We've not seen uh, a big boost to the economy. What little jam there has been for tax cuts has been extremely thinly spread, and I think that could be a mistake politically. And uh, Patricia Vaz, very briefly, a sentence, if you could. It's a long-term field budget, which I'm pleased about. It's not on its own going to stimulate enough growth, and therefore I'm worried about whether he'll meet his PSBR next year. OK. Well, you can get full details of the £1 cut in the standard rate and all the rest of it on BBC One with the news at 6 o'clock. But from all of us here on the Budget Programme, from Peter Snow and from me, good afternoon. <laughs>